questions. We now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 2203 in the name of Michael Matheson on the UK referendum on EU membership, impacts on justice and security in Scotland. Can I ask all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons now? And I call on Michael Matheson to open the debate. Thank you. Thank you, President Officer, and I welcome the opportunity to open this afternoon's debate. In the recent referendum, the people of Scotland supported continued membership of the EU. People in every single local authority area in Scotland voted to remain. The Scottish Government and a clear majority in this Parliament support continued membership of the EU. I acknowledge that some of us voted to leave, and that is a reality that we must address by listening and responding to concerns behind that vote. However, it's important to emphasise that justice matters in Scotland, including civil, criminal and family law, are largely devolved matters. Scotland has always had its own separate and independent justice system and agencies. Over the past 40 years of EU membership, EU law has become woven into its fabric. Our independent justice agencies and legal professionals engage directly and extensively with their EU counterparts. Those arrangements benefit individual victims, families, businesses and communities here in Scotland and elsewhere in the EU. Yet we find ourselves, against the views of the people of Scotland, in a position where those arrangements are under serious threat. Justice and security measures are essential to how we operate as a modern society and how we engage with other nations. EU membership gives us access to the single market and access to the necessary laws and mechanisms to facilitate that market, to operate for the benefit of people and businesses. Individuals and companies gain access to buyers and sellers of goods and services across national borders and have their rights as employees or consumers recognised and protected. In the event of any dispute, cross-border commercial contracts can be enforced throughout the continent. This legal infrastructure supports the economy and affords opportunity for growth. With 500 million consumers, the EU is the world's largest single market. As well as supporting the single market, EU membership and justice and security measures make us safer and support the international cooperation which is vital to combat cross-border crime and terrorism. There will be those who will argue that leaving the EU will create new opportunities for cooperation or that we can use alternative mechanisms. However, we already know that those arrangements are less effective, slower and more costly than the benefits we already have from full EU membership. That is not just my view, but the view of the justice agencies and professional bodies who operate these arrangements on a daily basis. I want to talk in more detail about some of the specific practical measures that will be put at risk if Scotland was no longer a full participant in EU justice and home affairs matters. Leaving the EU puts at risk a range of cooperation across both civil and criminal law including police cooperation, which assists in tackling organised crime, helping to make the people of Scotland safe, and also to live and work across the EU. For example, Europol is central to the fight against organised crime and terrorism. It plays a key role in facilitating and supporting efforts of Police Scotland and other key partners in implementing our serious organised crime strategy. I recently visited Europol in The Hague and was briefed by the director and his team on the resources and support that are available to help confront the growing threat from organised crime and terrorism. Europol supports over 18,000 cross-border investigations each year and provides invaluable support to law enforcement agencies right across Europe. Whether it's tackling human trafficking or money laundering, 
we must show solidarity with our friends across Europe. Now is not the time to walk away, particularly with the increase in online threats. We must work together to face these challenges and safeguard our communities here in Scotland. I'll give way <laughs> to the I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary giving way. He moved on from saying we need to discuss Europol to saying we are walking away. Does he accept we are not walking away? The Home uh, Affairs Minister, Brandon Lewis, said to Parliament yesterday that he will be reporting to Parliament shortly on the future of the engagement between the UK and Europol. So we're not walking away. That will be announced shortly. <laughs> well, you should listen to what I said. I said now is not the time to walk away, but yeah. you should also be aware that the regulations need to be signed up to by January. The execution of investigations takes months in planning and months to then execute in a situation itself. The delay of the UK on this matter and the dithering of the UK on this matter is putting these types of joint investigations at risk. That's why the UK government needs to move forward on the e Europol regulations as quickly as possible to make sure we minimise that particular risk. We would also like to make sure that we maintain the other aspects of cross-border cooperation that take place within Europe. And I know that members, some members in here will say that alternative arrangements for cross-border cooperation could be taken forward, for example, through Europol. But those arrangements do not offer the same level of opportunity for cooperation or sharing of information which exists currently and should be acknowledged as being suboptimal when compared with continuing membership of Europol. There are many other measures which may be affected. Eurojust, uh, which facilitates cross-border investigations and prosecutions. European Crim uh, Criminal Records Information System, uh, which facilitates the sharing of EU-wide convictions in states of residence uh, against individuals, uh, to name but a few. But I want to turn, President Officer, in particular to the issue of European arrest warrants. Serious and organised criminals take no account of <coughs> borders. An ability to pursue individuals who commit serious crime effectively, apprehend and bring them to court is vital. It's also important for the protection of the Scottish public that Scotland, along with the rest of the UK, does not risk becoming viewed as a safe haven by those seeking to escape justice. Interested agencies and uh, professional bodies in Scotland are unanimous about this risk. Indeed, when an opt-out was under consideration in 2013, both the then Lord Advocate and the present Lord Advocate, who was then the Vice Dean of the Faculty of Advocates, gave oral evidence in support of European arrest warrants to the House of Lords. ACPOS, the Crown Office, the Faculty of Advocates, Justice, the Law Society of Scotland, as well as the Scottish Government, have all advised the UK Government of their support for this instrument. Theresa May, when she was Home Secretary, said that European arrest warrants and other EU justice and security measures are both practical and necessary to protect us from serious criminals and terrorists. Yet, within the Westminster Parliament and now within the UK Government, there are those who are actively opposing European arrest warrants. We should be clear that if we leave the EU without putting successor arrangements in place, the advantages of speed and streamlined process which the European arrest warrant provides and which all parties benefit from will be lost. The repeal of the EU justice measures will also impact on civil aspects. In their evidence to the current Scottish Parliament Committee inquiry into the implementation of the EU referendum for Scotland, the Law Society of Scotland noted that many aspects of both reserved and devolved law have been influenced by EU law and that rights and opportunities have been afforded to individuals and businesses under EU law. This includes civil justice, company law, consumer law, employment law, environmental law, mental health and disability law, equality and human rights and family law. I'd like to highlight in particular cross-border commercial impacts and the potential impact on family law. When a family has links to more than one EU member state, there are benefits of cross-border rules. 
The Brussels II regulations covers cross-border matrimonial matters, parental responsibility and international parental child abduction. This regulation is the main instrument for families involved in cross-border divorce or family proceedings. We have yet to establish from the UK Government our future relationship with the EU in family law uh, and what it will be in the future. It's important that we make sure that we continue to engage with other EU member states to try and ensure that our citizens don't find themselves at a disadvantage. On the commercial side, recent changes to EU rules on jurisdiction and enforcement of court judgments came into force just last year. The UK Government opted into these regulations at an early stage, acknowledging the importance of a streamlined regime for resolving cross-border disputes at a commercial level. Sign officer, the Scottish Government's top priority is to ensure that justice and home affairs measures are given the status they merit in the Brexit negotiations and to achieve the most developed and seamless levels of cooperation as possible in future with EU partners. I'm also determined that we should ensure effective engagement and communication with agencies and professional bodies who use and understand the justice and home affairs measures in Europe, as well as with victims and consumer groups and academics to help build the best possible evidence to inform Scotland's contribution to the negotiation process. I'd like to take this opportunity to ensure that our message is heard loud and clear. Scotland voted as a whole to remain in the EU and we want to maintain both the benefits of continuing collaboration and cooperation between our justice system and other member states. <coughs> I understand that the Lord Advocate will be in Brussels later this month to meet with EU justice stakeholders to ensure that Scotland's prosecution interests are properly protected. The Collaborative Justice Board uh, of key justice leaders has also established an EU subgroup which will work to ensure the interests of Scotland's separate and independent justice system are represented and protected in the post-EU referendum negotiations. Officials will engage directly with the Law Society of Scotland, the Faculty of Advocates, in recognising the implications of EU membership and the referendum outcome for our legal professionals and those who rely on their services. We will continue to engage with uh, the UK Government and our counterparts there to ensure that Scotland's interests are represented and that we are able to influence that, influence it that where possible. President Officer, the UK Government must recognise our interests in this matter and engage with us as full partners. We are not content to be simple consultees in this matter. We must be centrally involved as partners in this process not treated as bystanders. Then also, we in the Scottish Government and this Parliament are looking to protect Scotland's interests generally, as well as arguing for the least damaging impact for, from the EU referendum for the UK as a whole. This is significant to the security and safety of all of the people of Scotland. I hope that, I, that our aim will be supported by all members in this chamber. I move the motion in my name. Yeah. Thank you. I call on Douglas Ross to open for the Conservatives. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I welcome the opportunity to open this debate for the Scottish Conservatives. As this is the first justice debate we have had in Parliament for a couple of weeks, uh, I want to take the opportunity, if I may, to put on record the Scottish Conservatives and I'm sure the entire Parliament's um, Best wishes to councils Deborah Lawson and Robert Fitzsimmons, who were deliberately knocked down in Glasgow a week past Sunday. PC Lawson suffered multiple fractures and PC Fitzsimmons was also taken to hospital. Uh, and events such as these remind us of the bravery of our officers, which they show day in, day out. And while these events are thankfully rare, we must never forget that for us to live safely, our officers have to be dedicated to their task. And it is clear that Deborah Lawson and <coughs> Robert Fitzsimmons we're certainly that, and we wish them both a speedy and full recovery. 
Just last week, the Prime Minister, Theresa May, reiterated that the country is facing a negotiation of tremendous importance. She continued, it is imperative that the devolved administrations play their part in making it work. Together with stakeholders, it is therefore both right and sensible to determine the repercussions for, of Brexit for Scotland's justice system. It would be remiss to suggest otherwise, given that we have, as the Cabinet Secretary said, a separate and unique legal system within the United Kingdom. And I note that the Scottish Parliament's Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee, as well as respected organisations such as the Faculty of Advocates and the Law Society, have already embarked on this sizeable undertaking. But let us be very clear. It is the UK government that is negotiating our withdrawal from the European Union. As the Cabinet Secretary mentioned in his opening remarks, um, leave, uh, the UK, uh, sorry, for the UK to leave the EU framework will impact on the civil and criminal justice in Scotland as well as policing. No one is under the... Uh, I will take interventions from several members but not from Stuart Stevenson because I can already tell him what his intervention will be. It will be to ask me three very random questions to which he has three very random answers and I've got a lot to get through. So on this occasion I will not take an intervention from Mr Stevenson. I, I have sat through many debates in this chamber in my short time as an MSP and I've got his measure very quickly. Um, so I will carry on uh, if I may. No one is under the illusion that this will be easy and together with her cabinet the Prime Minister has repeatedly acknowledges the challenges ahead. The Faculty of Advocates has emphasised that and I quote, it appears to us inconceivable that it will be possible to review all that law and determine what to keep and what to remove in time for the last case day of the UK's membership of the EU. And I would seek to reassure those concerned about the transitional arrangements that as and when we repeal the European Communities Act, we will convert the body of existing EU law into British law. I further commend the Law Society, which has already met with the Secretary of State for Scotland, David Mendel, for underscoring the importance... Well, if, I'll take an intervention from Miss Ewing if she wants to stand up and get involved. I'm speaking Ewing. from a sentry position. I'll give you time to put your card in, Miss Ewing. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Annabel Ewing. Yeah, I just wondered if, if the member would therefore care to define this new concept of British, British law. law. Interesting. I, I apologise, and clearly in the fluster for Mrs. Ewing to get her card in, she was also uh, not prepared for that. I did mean UK law, so I apologise if that has offended in any way, and I clarify that for the Chamber. Uh, but I was saying I further commend the Law Society, which has already met with the Secretary of State for Scotland, David Mundell, for underscoring the importance of ensuring stability in law post-Brexit and for emphasising that uh, specifically in connection with legal matters, changes will require to be carefully thought through. And I really believe that the UK government has ex uh, exhibited judiciousness towards the negotiations so far. Unlike those, oh well, we already hear Mr... Uh, uh, Mr um, uh, the, minister, the Minister for removing uh, Scotland from the EU in that Cabinet position, Mr Russell, uh, mumbling away there, and I look forward to his mumblings later on today. But we have already heard from the SNP that they are not looking towards what the UK Government are doing, and they are only looking at their own way forward. We need to be mindful that the UK is negotiating with a union of 27 other members. Who, will institute, uh, sorry, who the Institute for Government points out will play a crucial role in informal negotiations and will almost certainly have to individually ratify any final agreement. For Mike Russell, there's the name, for Mike Russell to stand up in the chamber last week and denounce the UK government for reaction, inaction and confusion was quite simply childish and, I must say, amateurish. The SNP hasn't been proactive in its approach, as it would have us believe. It's well, yeah, that tells you everything you need to know about that uh, intervention. Uh, it has not been proactive in its approach. It has been preemptive. In the four months since the outcome of the EU referendum was announced, the First Minister almost immediately attempted to embark on a PR tour of the European uh, member states, only to be respectfully reminded by the German government, the Danish Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Czech government, the Estonian Foreign uh, Affairs Ministry, and none other than the President of the U European Council, that in such self-aggrandisement she has stepped well beyond her remit. And together with her cohort of Cabinet colleagues, the First Minister has once again started to agitate for independence, flaming the flames of Brexit as a cause celeb for the SNP's re relentless obse obsession with uh, separation, meanwhile neglecting the powerhouse parliament we have here, that we were all elected to and to use the unprecedented new powers we have. In fact, in just four months, 
In just four months, including the summer recess, we have had no less than three statements in the Chamber on Brexit. Today's debate is the sixth de such debate of its kind. We had a running commentary from the SNP on the European Union since the 24th of June, and it even launched a consultation on a second referendum bill. Well, no surprise Mr Russell wants to come in on Mr. that. Mr Michael Russell. Uh, well, I'm just wondering about consistency. You opened your speech by saying it was right and sensible to have this debate to consider the implications of Brexit. Now you've contradicted yourself within six minutes. Well, to this debate on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives, and we will discuss it. But the Scottish government, the Scottish government, has allocated its time to this. Well, if you want to intervene again, you can stand up rather than uh, speaking from a sedentary position. But the point is, well, I okay, I'll go. I'll give way. Uh, the, words, the words you used were right. Uh, the member used, sorry, presiding officer, were right and sensible. The, the point I am making is, we have had three statements on the EU referendum. We have had six debates in this chamber. While we should be debating policing, while we should be debating the NHS, which I think the First Minister struggled with at FMQs last week, there has been a, a domination of the government time on Brexit issues. And I think people in Scotland want the government to be focusing on the bread and butter issues and getting that right, rather than trying to pick fights to fan the flames for their own separation agenda. As yet, not one piece of legislation has been introduced to this Parliament for scrutiny since the May elections, and that tells you everything you need to know about this Government's priority. I need not remind members that the developments unfolding around us mark a huge constitutional change. But it seems that far from advocating that Scotland's interest in these negotiations, the SNP is only advocating on its own behalf. And that is a great shame, as such an approach detracts from the task at hand. As my amendment today uh, to the motion points out, it is clear that Scotland, as part of Great Britain, has benefit benefited from pan-European cooperation in justice and home affairs, particularly in the area of policing and criminal justice, and participation in the 35 opt-ins negotiated by the UK government. Now, it's my understanding that the UK has already opted out of almost all EU substantive criminal law. But we have benefited from access to agencies such as the Cabinet Secretary said Europol, as well as information sharers, sharing measures including Schengen information system, the custom information system used in trafficking and drugs cases, and the prom decisions which provide access to police databases on fingerprints and DNA. The European arrest warrant has also helped to facilitate and expedite extradition proceedings with 48 extraditions to Scotland since January 2011 and 367 from Scotland. These are sensible measures that demonstrate the importance of a pan-European collaboration and cooperation in the area of criminal justice. And this has been brought to bear by the work of the Scottish Crime Camp at Gart Kosh, which is often underpinned, as Police Scotland has pointed out, the exchange of information and intelligence with other nations, achieved through close working relations and institutions, such as Europol and Interpol. Now, the Cabinet Secretary has expressed concern about the uncertain status of the UK's future involvement in Europol beyond May 2017. Now, the Scottish Government rightly argues it has played an effective role in providing analytical support, enabling law enforcement and information exchange, and producing a threat assessment. But as I said in my intervention, the Minister in the UK Government mentioned to Parliament yesterday that they will be updating the UK Parliament on that announcement in the very short term. Now, I'm not here to be a spokesman for the UK Government. The Cabinet Secretary has his own channels of communication for that. But he will no doubt be aware that the Home Secretary, Amber Rudd, has confirmed that the UK Government will be having discussions on how to continue some form of involvement within the agencies of the EU to help to keep us safe. David Davis, the MP, sorry, MP, the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union, also recently emphasised in relation to Europol that the aim is to, prefer, to preserve the relationship with the European Union on security matters as best we can. We are across that and, of course, are aiming to maintain it. Now, let us not forget, as my colleague Liam Kerr will shortly emphasise, that there are many other mechanisms for cooperation on matters of security and policing, and these should not be overlooked. Our amendment today looks at the wider issues of security, and in my own area of Murray, our communities in Kinloss and Lossiemouth play a vital role in security and protection of the entire United Kingdom. Lossiemouth is eagerly awaiting the arrival. A point of order, Mr Stevenson. The member may have inadvertently described himself as the member for Murray. He said, my own area, Murray. Could you invite him to properly describe himself as a member for the Highlands and Islands? Uh, Mr. Stevenson makes a point. It's not a point of order. Douglas Ross to continue. And you've got plenty of time, Mr. Ross. Uh, thank you very much. Um, another 
bit of time wasted in this Parliament by Mr Stevenson, because if I read out what I said, in my own area of Murray, I live in Murray, I am born and bred in Murray, I think I can class that as my own area. I represent and I'm proud to represent Murray as a wider Highlands and Islands region, but I will mention Murray as my home area whenever I should like. Now, as I was saying when I was so rudely interrupted, Lossiemouth is eagerly awaiting the arrival of the new P8s, and having been lucky enough to have flown in one of them recently, I know the huge investment there will be for Murray, if I'm allowed to say that, for Scotland and for the United Kingdom with that defence infrastructure. It is clear that this will ultimately be a bespoke agreement between the, uh, an independent sovereign United Kingdom and the European Union, rather than a binary choice. It presents an opportunity to engage and implement those measures that foster European-wide cooperation and best serve the interests of the United Kingdom and Scotland. And this is an opportunity, not an obstacle. And uh, it is this which needs to inform our thinking over the months and uh, the months ahead. Uh, presiding officer, to finish, democracy isn't about rerunning the vote until you get the result you want. Democracy is respecting the outcome of the vote once and for all. Post-Brexit, the UK government is working to deliver the best possible deal for the entire country. I sincerely hope the SNP will support its work in this regard over the coming months across all devolved portfolios, rather than run a grievance, grumble and gripe campaign that self-servingly promotes the SNP agenda to the detriment of Scotland's interests. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. I call on Claire Baker to move uh, the amendment in her name and speak to the motion. And uh, just to let all members know, there is plenty of time in today's debate to take interventions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, this is a welcome opportunity to discuss the impact of Brexit on our justice system in Scotland and the security of our communities as well. Uh, those who advocated leaving the European Union argued it would make Britain safer in the context of an uninformed and depressing debate over immigration. Many of us who argued for the UK continuing membership of the EU put forward the case that leaving would in fact threaten our security and weaken our justice system and nothing I have heard following the vote in June has caused me to revise that opinion. Over the past decade we have made vital progress in our security systems collaborating with forces across Europe as a member of the EU. We have had no information either for those who argued for Brexit or from the UK Government about what plans are going to be brought forward to secure the progress that has been made through European cooperation on justice and security. It has not been detailed how the potential for greater collaboration, which undoubtedly existed when Britain is within the EU, can be made once we are outside of the EU. We risk being isolated at a time when there is an even greater need for cooperation. So I think it is right and I welcome that the Scottish Government has brought forward this opportunity to discuss these vital matters. We have heard that Brexit means Brexit, but we have heard little else beyond that. In Scotland, we may not agree, all agree what the right response to Brexit is, but at least we are having a vibrant debate on what the options might be and ideas are being brought forward. The lack of detail and strategy from UK ministers can only raise anxieties over what the final impact will be, not least on justice and security. There is additional complexity as many of these areas are devolved or are unique to Scotland. And in recognition of this, an amendment today calls for work to be undertaken to determine the full extent of leaving the EU on our separate legal system to ensure that Scotland's if just let me finish the sentence, if to ensure that Scotland's interests are protected and to fully inform the negotiation process. I'm grateful to the member for giving way because I think she raises a very important point here and that is that the unique nature of the Scottish justice system within these negotiations make it so important that the UK government recognise that and it's given its right place uh, in the course of these negotiations and for the Scottish government to be involved in that process and I think the member has identified that in her amendment which we will be supporting here this evening. Uh, I'm pleased to hear that uh, from the Cabinet Secretary. I think it is important that we recognise the separate and unique nature of the Scottish legal system and that the UK Government is well aware of the different implications there might be. It's also incumbent on us to be clear about what those implications are. And I note that the SPICE briefing does highlight that a specific group has been set up within the Justice Board uh, to consider the impact of Brexit on the justice system and that Police Scotland have also established a working group. But I would need to be confident that these groups have the specific skills and expertise to understand the legal implications and would appreciate further detail on how this work can be taken forward. 
Um, I don't want to be in a situation where we'll be looking at emergency legislation or having to deal with unintended consequences as a, as a result of this decision. Uh, EU membership has strengthened our justice system within the modern world. Through the Extradition Act 2003, both the Scottish and the UK government brought in measures to ensure that prisoners from other countries within the EU can be returned to their country of origin, either at the conclusion of their sentence or serve it there. That can only be beneficial to security and justice in Scotland. Figures suggest that the average extradition process takes 97 days. For non-EU states, that takes approximately 10 months. The European arrest warrant has led to the arrest of individuals responsible for sexual offences and murders in Scotland. We simply do not know what the impact of leaving the European Union will be on the UK's inclusion in a system which has been vital to returning criminals whose offences have impacted seriously on communities here in Scotland. As the Law Society briefing says, Following a withdrawal from the EU, it is possible that, without the trust and mutual recognition between EU member states that underpins the European arrest warrant, the process for the surrender of individuals will be more expensive, complex and time-consuming, and would require a new treaty to underpin any alternative arrangements. Extradition proceedings would become more prolonged and in custody cases create significant additional costs. At the moment, there are no assurances that the legislative provisions which underpin these arrangements will remain in place or be replicated after Brexit, or how these offenders would be repatriated in the future. We also recognise the importance of being part of Europol, even more important as we consider the changing nature of crime with threats of organised crime, <coughs> human trafficking, child sexual exploitation, cybercrime and terrorism. We are in the regrettable situation where we are urging the UK Government to accept a new Europol regulation by January to ensure continuing membership, while we also face restricted membership following Brexit. For all the reassurances from exiting the EU ministers, it is worrying when senior police officers warn it will be more complex to achieve the same that they can achieve now after leaving the EU, when we would have a restricted membership of Europol and no influence over decision making. Um, Rob Wainwright, the director of Europol, a position that is currently held by a, a, British, um, by a British officer, um, so he's the director of Europol, has said that the UK could face becoming a second tier member and that alarmingly our access to Schengen information system could be revoked, all of which will negatively impact on our ability to address human trafficking among other issues. There's also the impact on civil justice matters, which is set to be significant. Uh, rules on cross-border family law cases, impact on divorce proceedings, custody cases, access judgments and maintenance support. All hugely important regulations for families affected by these issues and provide protection for children at risk of parental abduction. Another example, the taking of evidence regulation simplifies rules for taking evidence in one country for direct use in another country. What will Brexit mean for all these areas? A return to complex negotiations? The use of consular or diplomatic routes? Can we retain these mechanisms while no longer being a member? There must be clarity on these significant issues. Even before Brexit, the UK government had indicated its wish to withdraw from the European Convention of Human Rights. Not every judgment of that court has been lauded in this chamber, but any objective analysis would surely conclude that the Convention has been of enormous importance in securing and improving human rights across Europe, and indeed assisting the promotion of human rights across the world. The extraordinary decision of the Conservative Party that it wishes to end UK membership of the Convention becomes all the more likely as a result of Brexit, as membership was a condition of EU membership. It also shows just how far the Tories have regressed that they now wish to abandon an institution which Winston Churchill played a key role in establishing. So, presiding officer, so much for the Tories posturing as the party of law and order when a constitutional crisis resulting from their own internal party disputes threatens the future of European action on justice and security, ultimately putting our communities in Scotland at risk of being less safe, not safer. Crime knows no borders. It is increasingly international and serious. And organised crime in Scotland is often connected to activity not just across the UK, but across Europe too. It requires European governments and justice agencies to work together to counter it. But the progress that has been made in this area through our membership of the EU can only be made harder and less effective by Brexit. And yet we hear very little from the UK government about how they will mitigate its impact. That is not good enough for communities across our country. 
They want to be safer from terrorism, safer from the actions of serious and organised criminals, have a legal system that recognises the international nature of personal relationships and business transactions, and one that can deliver justice swiftly. This is all being put at risk by leaving the EU. This is not a situation that's been created by the Scottish Government, but the Cabinet Secretary needs to continue to challenge the UK Government to protect the vital mechanisms that our justice system relies on. Their priority must be a deal which protects cooperation in the interests of us all, a deal which protects vulnerable people and maintains the UK's position as a partner in dealing with crime, and one which fully responds to the unique aspects of Scots law and its interwoven relationship with EU justice matters. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. We now move to the open part of the debate, and I call on Joan McAlpine to be followed by Margaret Mitchell. Joan McAlpine. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I am very pleased to be speaking today on this important topic. It is perhaps an aspect of Brexit that has not been given the attention today that it merits, so I am pleased that the Government is highlighting it by bringing it to the Chamber today. Uh, the Law Society of Scotland has submitted written evidence to the European Committee on the implications for, of Scotland uh, of leaving the EU uh, for its members, their clients and the services that they provide. Uh, the Society's submission outlines in stark plain language the scale of the challenge the legal profession and their clients face. The Cabinet Secretary has already alluded to some of the aspects of law um, that the Law Society pointed to, and I would like to quote them in full. Uh, civil justice, company law, competition law, consumer law, criminal law, employment law, environment law, equality law, family law, financial services, human rights law through the Charter of Fundamental Rights, immigration law, intellectual property law, mental health and disability law. I expect others to focus in detail on aspects of national security and criminal law, as the Cabinet Secretary and others have already done. So I won't do that here today, except to say that it's absolutely clear that the safety of our citizens is threatened if the extensive networks of cooperation on crime fighting, crime solving and intelligence gathering are damaged. I want to look at justice insofar as it relates to the European single market, which is so important to the prosperity of us all. In the realm of business, the Law Society points out that EU law has relevance for employers, for example, Working Time Directive and the Posted Workers Directive. European law Im impacts on business innovation, a key building block of economic prosperity, and inventors benefit, for, for example, from the European Unitary Patent. European law underpins the European single market, which the UK government appears determined to leave. The law is designed to ensure fairness and equality for those operating in the market and producers are protected with laws on food standards, environmental standards. Procurers of services are protected by laws designed to prevent corruption and favouritism. Exporters have the common commercial policy. SMEs, as well as large corporations, have recourse to the Late Payments Directive. And of course, a key aspect of the single market is the legal right to set up a business in another member state, an aspect of the acquired rights of European citizens that we are all apparently going to be stripped of when the Great Repeal Act falls. The helpful spice briefing uh, for today's debate details a number of legal provisions in the Amsterdam Treaty of 1997, which are essential to the smooth functioning of the single market. For example, the Insolvency Regulation of 2002, which allows insolvency proceedings to be brought in most relevant member states. The 2008 Lisbon Treaty, 2009 Lisbon Treaty rather, took this further, and under Article 81, the EU is expected to develop judicial cooperation in civil and commercial matters with cross-border implications, quotes, particularly uh, when it's necessary for the proper functioning of the internal market. Previous UK governments clearly thought this was of benefit to business because even though they had the right to opt out of many justice aspects of Lisbon, the UK opted into the European Small Claims Procedure, which can apply cross-border, uh, which means um, businesses can uh, apply for cross-border small claims. And we now have the European Enforcement and Payment Orders, which create a fast-track procedure for the enforcement of cross-border orders for uncontested claims. Uh, Post-Brexit, our businesses face real headaches with regards to dispute resolution. 
What will happen, for example, to the Rome 1 and Rome 2 regulations on law applicable to contractual and non-contractual obligations? The London law firm Slaughter and May produced a Brexit essentials briefing which notes that post-Brexit, the UK would have to replace European arrangements for disputes resolution or face the prospect of its court's judgments becoming less effective across Europe. If I could quote it briefly, it says, without a replacement, international parties might be persuaded to nominate an EU member state rather than the UK as the forum for their disputes if a pan-European judgment was important to them or alternatively switch to arbitration. The effect of Brexit on justice matters will have a direct and, I believe, a detrimental impact on Scotland's standing and influence. Scotland is a separate jurisdiction with a system of law that is as independent as any other nation in Europe. The Treaty of uh, Union of 1707, as we all know, protects Scottish law and our completely separate legal system with its own civil and criminal law, its own courts, legal profession and prosecution services, a source of great pride. And of course, most police and criminal justice matters are dissolved, devolved under the Scotland Act 1998. Because of this long-standing legal independence, Scottish legal institutions have a recognition in Brussels. The Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, to use one example, participate in the UK Government's Eurojust Oversight Board. Uh, Police Scotland has a presence at the Europol Liaison Office in The Hague. And that was very well illustrated today by the Cabinet Secretary's description of his trip uh, to Europol in The Hague. Losing that recognition means a reduction in Scotland's international influence. One of the things that the First Minister has identified as a priority in her mission to protect Scotland's status in Europe. Uh, that's why I support the motion today. Um, the development of European law has fundably been, fundamentally been about collaboration between states and jurisdictions. In Scotland's case, that has enhanced the influence of our justice system and our standing as a country, albeit one that is a sub-state of the United Kingdom. Scotland, in matters of, just, of justice, is already in many ways an independent country, but one that collaborates effectively across borders thanks to EU structures. As the motion demands, uh, we must have full involvement in all negotiations between the UK and the EU to protect our independent justice system and, crucially, all those individuals, organisations and businesses who depend on it functioning effectively. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I know that we've got quite a bit of time in hand, so, I mean, you can have open speeches of seven minutes now. Isn't that excellent news? Uh, Margaret Mitchell, be followed by Fulton McGregor. Ms Mitchell, please. Is your microphone on? Yes, it is. That's it. Thank Excuse you. Me. Yeah. The motion seeks to assess the impact of Brexit on justice and security issues. Here it's important to stress at the outset that it would be complete folly and totally impractical for the UK before Article 50 has been formally initiated to set out at this stage its negotiating position on any aspect of Brexit, including justice and security issues. So this debate can serve little purpose other than providing superficial, uh, a superficial assessment of the impact of Brexit on the various areas of security cooperation that exist between the UK and the, U the EU at present. What we can be sure of is, as Prime the Prime Minister has repeatedly stated, is there are going to be lengthy negotiations over the course of the two years and more. What the UK government is going to do is deliver on the vote of the British people to leave the European Union, and it's going to be ambitious in its negotiations to negotiate the best deal for the British people. Also, what is not in doubt, if you allow me to make some progress, Mr. Stevenson, also what is not in doubt is that it makes sense for EU states to continue to cooperate with the EU UK after we withdraw, because quite simply, it's in their best interest to do so. In fact, it's for this very reason that EU states currently cooperate on operational law enforcement issues with countries outside the EU. Put another way, what do Albania, Australia, Canada, Colombia, FYR, Macedonia, Iceland, Moldova, Montenegro, Norway, Serbia, 
Switzerland, Liechtenstein, Monaco and the USA all have in common? Well, they are all non-EU countries with operational agreements with Europol. In fact, it's widely acknowledged that America has more officers at Europol than most EU member states. Frontex, the EU border. Yes. John McAlpine. Uh, thank you. I, I thank the member for taking an intervention. D does, she, does she agree with David Armand, Deputy Director General of the National Crime Agency, who said that whatever measures we negotiate will be less of a solution or suboptimal compared to the arrangements that we currently have with the EU? Absolutely Margaret not. Mitchell. I mean, why should it be? We're in a new position. We are um, not following any deal that has been made with any other country. We already have these arrangements in place. Why should there be any less when we leave, when it's in everyone's best interest to continue them? Frontex, the EU border agency, is another example of an EU agency which has a working relationship with no fewer than 17 non-EU states and it's in negotiation with a further seven non-EU states. Furthermore, despite the UK not being part of Schengen, it still cooperates with Frontex on issues such as human trafficking. Meanwhile, on a more routine basis, security cooperation is to be found in, for example, passenger name records for airlines which are shared between the EU and countries such as the United States of America, Canada and Australia. So suffice to say, there's no shortage of ways non-EU states are at present cooperating with the EU on security issues, and this will continue to be the case post-Brexit. Some argued during the EU referendum that their principal reason for voting Remain was because they believed the UK is safer within the EU rather than outside. However, this fails to take cognizance of the all too tragic recent events in Europe, which include the Paris bombings, the atrocities in Brussels, and in Germany, the organized harassment of women in Cologne. All of this has taken place against a background of and interrelated with the migration crisis engulfing the EU. So the unpalatable truth is... <sighs> Mr McGregor. Bill McGregor. Yeah, I thank the member for taking intervention. I just wonder if the member would comment on the former Director General of MI5's claims that the UK being safer outside the EU are nonsensical and spurious. Margaret Mitchell. He's, of course, entitled to his, his opinion, but it's difficult to how, how he could reach that, con that conclusion, given the unpalatable truth it is that Europe has lost control of its internal, external bor bor borders, and that this has provided the opportunity to answer Mr. Uh, McGregor's position uh, point uh, specifically, this has provided the opportunity for extremists and potential terrorists to hold EU passports. <laughs> Presiding officer, whilst the Scottish Government has wallowed in prediction of gloom and doom about every possible aspect of Britain leaving the EU, there are two obvious advantages of Brexit from a justice and security point of view. The first being the potential for the UK to take back control of its borders and the second is Euro judges no longer being able to prevent the UK deporting dangerous terrorists. Furthermore, the UK will, remember, will remain a member of NATO and as Major General Julian Thompson, who spent more than three decades, I think have been very generous with interventions. And you have time if seven. you wish, but it's up to you. Uh, you don't know how much else I've got to say, <laughs> Deputy Presiding I've Officer. I've still got plenty of time, but it's up to you. Member. In that case. Ms Baker. Does the member recognise that much of what she's claiming this afternoon is just that, it's just claims and assertions? There are no guarantees on any of these issues around Europol membership or European arrest warrants that she can give this afternoon, and that's exactly the point of the debate, because we're all hugely concerned about the impact this will be. The member seems oblivious to those concerns. Margaret Mitchell. Well, I regret to say Claire Baker joins um, the SNB in her glass being continually half full. She seeks um, to find problems where none currently insist, and there's no 
evidence that they will exist in the future. Furthermore, as I was saying, as Major General Julian Thompson, who spent more than three decades in the Royal Marines and commanded British forces in the Fon uh, Falklands conflict, pointed out, the benefits of being a member of NATO far outweigh those of being a member of the EU. And in terms of defence against terrorists, he states that information sharing between the security services of the Anglosphere Five Eyes Alliance between the UK, US, Canada, Canada, Australia and New Zealand is particularly beneficial for UK security due to the trust established over decades of working uh, with their agencies. But in addition to this, sharing of tactical intelligence um, can be um, also brought forward with EU countries and established on a case-to-case -case basis. In conclusion, presiding officer, According to the UK's former intelligence chief, Sir Richard Dearlove, the UK currently provides more intelligence to the EU than it gets back. And to quote Sir Richard, given Britain is Europe's leader in intelligence and security matters and gives much more than it gets in return, it's difficult to imagine any of the other EU members ending the relationship they already enjoy with the UK. Thank you very much. Fulton McGregor, followed by Jenny Mara. Mr McGregor, please. Thank you, President Officer. You'd be forgiven for thinking that this has ceased to be the, Sco the Parliament of Scotland if the Conservative Amendment is anything to go by. So let me remind Douglas Ross and his colleagues that the Parliament is here to represent the people of Scotland, first, last and always. The people of Scotland spoke loud and clear. We want to remain part of the European Union. Dare I say it, remain means remain. Over the last few months, since the referendum, the lack of a plan from the UK Government for Brexit has been quite astounding. It's become increasingly lately that the UK Government's lack of preparation is going to result in Scotland being dragged out of the EU with a hard Brexit. Now, the Prime Minister can repeat Brexit means Brexit over and over again. But if the day comes that Scotland ceases to be a member of the EU, we need to know that every possible action to protect the interests of the Scottish people has been taken. Yes. Graeme Simpson. I'm grateful to uh, Fulton McGregor. Would uh, Fulton McGregor accept that Scotland is not a member of the EU and that it's in fact the UK that is a member? Fulton McGregor. Uh, thank the, the, the members for the, the question. Um, the, Scotland is um, uh, known to be a, a country, as a country, and as a country we voted to remain. And that is what this government and this parliament are trying to respect. That means the Prime Minister must engage in constructive dialogue with the Scottish Government and Scottish Ministers must be involved in negotiations with the EU. Over the past few months, the message from the Prime Minister and the UK Government is that they have no interest in listening to the Scottish Government. And I therefore welcome the renewed commitment from the First Minister that she will do whatever it takes to protect Scotland's interests. Presiding officer, there are not many areas as important as justice for any parliament to discuss, and it's crucial that Scotland's voice is heard during the Brexit negotiations. Scotland has always had an independent justice system, as other members have said, and there must be measures in place to ensure that the security of Scotland post-Brexit. It is of deep concern to me that the current arrangements between law enforcement agencies in Scotland and the rest of the EU are under threat. We regularly see the successes of these agencies in tackling organised crime, particularly surrounding the child sexual ex exploitation, human trafficking and cybercrime, and I was glad to hear Mr Ross um, mentioned the work of the Crime Campus in Gartcosh, which is, of course, in my constituency. Just this year, Police Scotland were involved in an operation with the Romanian authorities to halt an operation of trafficking of individuals for sexual exploitation, resulting in eight victims being taken into care and the, rest, uh, the arrest of those involved. It is imperative that Scotland continues to be involved in detecting and stopping large-scale cross-border criminal activity. Douglas Ross mentioned Interpol, and that is an important part of maintaining Scotland's security. But I'm left wondering, despite, the, um, despite what, what Margaret Mitchell had said, uh, whether his proposal to amend the government motion to remove any mention of Europol is indeed an acceptance from the Conservative Party that, unless stopped, their hard Brexit policy will see an end to the UK and Scotland's cooperation in combating cross-border crime. Um, and Ms Baker uh, alluded to those concerns as well. The ability to share information quickly and coordinate operations with other law enforcement agencies using Europol is key to detecting, disrupting and detaining criminals throughout Europe. 
Presiding officer, I want to briefly touch on the European arrest warrant. There is a great risk that exit from the EU will result in this fantastic system being unavailable to police and prosecutors in Scotland. This will result in an increase in cost and time in bringing criminals to justice. There is also the impact on victims of crime who, be, who will be subjected to months or years of uncertainty. Presiding officer, the Prime Minister must take her head out of the sand and start discussing these serious issues. There have been no meaningful plans outlined by our government and to date Nissan seems to, more, seems to know more than anyone else about the Brexit plans. These concerns are very real and entirely justified and are felt the length and breadth of Scotland. The Prime Minister must now invite Scottish Ministers to be fully involved in all discussions and negotiations. A bit shorter. Thanks. Thank you very much. It's always the case, Ms McGregor, with time in hand, speeches get shorter. don't know why. Uh, Jenny Mara to be followed by John Finney. Ms Mara, please. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I'd like to start this afternoon uh, by saying that I do not belittle the importance of Brexit and its consequences. Indeed, it is one of the biggest political issues of our time. But the continual debates in this cham chamber since the vote on the 23rd of June, I, I do agree with Douglas Ross, is taking focus from issues that are pertinent to our communities and the effect that the cuts are having uh, up and down this country. As I stand here today, there is a debate um, going on in one of uh, the communities in Dundee about the closure of a local police station, which it has been admitted is driven by a cost savings agenda and is going to take police officers out of that very community that they have served for years. And I would uh, beseech the government today that once its programme of these debates has ended, that we do get back on to the, the bread and butter issues that I think members in this chamber are very, very keen to discuss, and I think citizens of, th of this country want uh, to hear us discussing too. I'd like to turn uh, to the, the tabled uh, motion and amendments uh, this afternoon. I think what is most uh, striking for me from the Conservative amendment is the, the, the list, I think, of organisations that the, the Conservatives are keen to rely on for intelligence. They've cited NATO, the Five Eyes Intelligence Network. While I do not belittle the um, importance of these agencies in our security and crime agenda, I have to say that list seems very uh, weak and lacking without uh, the mention of Europol and the incredible um, and the incredible work that it does. What is clear today, yes, Douglas Ross. I thank Jenny Mara for taking an intervention. I'll reread very carefully what she was saying about NATO being very weak. But would she, however, concede that I fully mentioned Europol and the implications? <laughs> of what the government are planning to do and uh, announcing to the UK government as part of my speech. So it's not as if we ignored it. Jenny Mara. If Douglas Ross cares to read the official report, he'll find that I didn't say that. I said the, the list seems weak without Europol mention because it plays a central role in uh, crime prevention in this country. And he only needs to speak to the crime prevention, prevention agencies on this country that are working on child protection, uh, human trafficking, uh, prevention of internet paedophilia to, to learn uh, exactly that. Now, what is clear today is that hard decisions on Brexit are coming downstream faster than perhaps we could have anticipated. January next year, in just a few weeks' time, the UK government must indicate if it is willing to accept a new regulation on Europol. In simple terms, we need to decide whether we ask to continue with the Europol system that has to date evolved to be more and more crucial, I believe, in European policing cooperation and in preventing and tackling cross-border crime. Presiding officer, it is only about three years since I sat, I think you were there too, in a committee room upstairs at the Human Trafficking Summit organised by the Scottish Government and, and the Lord Advocate, listening to a key contribution from Europol on how Scotland would take its anti-human tra anti -human trafficking uh, efforts forward. They are absolutely integral to the work that the Human Trafficking Unit of Police Scotland is undertaking at the moment. We all know that human trafficking is a cross-border crime. 
with cross-border policing and prevention operations becoming more and more important. And ceasing this work and these networks will only let cross-border criminal networks thrive with the structure for a coordinated response destroyed. This was one of the many reasons I voted to remain in the European Union. And it's one of the reasons I believe that the UK Parliament must and should have a vote on the Brexit negotiations. Now, the voters' wishes across the UK must be respected, but I believe we must extricate ourselves from the EU with the best arrangements for our citizens at the end of that negotiation. And security and crime, time and time again, have always been one of the top priorities of our citizens. And that is why I am pleased to see that Michael Matheson has been to The Hague to find out more about Europol operations and Scotland's place in those operations. The European Counter-Terrorism Centre, the European Migrant Smuggling Centre and the European Cybercrime Centre, all centres established at Europol, are crucial to Scottish crime prevention and detecting. Just before the referendum this year, Europol assisted Police Scotland and the Romanian police to dismantle a Romanian organised crime network involved in the trafficking of Romanian victims here to Scotland for sexual exploitation. Europol also offers, supports the effective operation of the European arrest warrant and has, as colleagues have already articulated in the chamber this afternoon, the European arrest warrant is crucial in Scotland. Police Scotland has arrested 301 offenders according to the figures that I read, while 43 offenders have been returned to Scotland to face justice. And that traffic in both directions makes citizens safer through these arrangements. Presiding officer, I'd like to uh, finish by referring... Yes. Jo McAlpine. Um, I thank the member for taking an intervention. I think she raises some very important points there in her speech. Doesn't she agree that it's what she's, she's just told us about illustrates why it's important for us to deba deba debating this subject in the Parliament today? Jenny Mara. I do believe it is important to debate this, but as I said at the start, I think it was perfectly clear uh, to Ms McAlpine and everyone else what I said, that we're having continual debates on this and we must balance that properly with uh, also debating the issues that are current in our communities. If I can finish, presiding officer, if, if time permits, um, to refer to the amendment from my colleague Claire Baker. I think it's one of the most important amendments laid in these debates because there is a clear need for a full analysis of the impact of leaving the EU on Scotland's independent justice system to protect, and Claire Baker said this herself, against any unforeseen consequences and to fully inform the negotiation process. As we all know, Scotland's justice system and Scots law is unique. It will take specific consideration in the Brexit negotiations so it is only right that the preparatory work is done in advance by the Scottish Government to mitigate any surprises and unforeseen consequences. Loopholes in the law are not something that we want to discover months or years out from the Brexit negotiations. So this work needs to happen now to prevent that and I'm very happy to support our amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call on John Finney to be followed by Gil Patterson. Mr Finney, please. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Um, um, I think it's very important that we debate this. I think justice, as we've heard from Jenny Mara, is a top priority for our citizens, and I think the obligation that's placed on any state, however it's configured, is to provide security, uh, 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 see to the security of its citizens and provide justice for its citizens. And key to that is collaborative working. And that's what the European project was about. It was about collaborative working. And it wasn't to set aside the uh, unique nature of Scots law. It was the, the mix that was important. Now, it's certainly my view that the clear motivation for the European Union um, referendum was disengagement from that sort of approach. And it's certainly my view that that's led to alienation and in some respects disrespect for the United Kingdom and by default Scotland. And I think it's put security at risk and I think it's been gesture politics, and we continue to hear gesture politics, but we've been there before, and I think it's only the Cabinet Secretary that briefly alluded to this. We're this before when it came to the question of the Lisbon Treaty, which was agreed in 2009. There was a, a final decision required by the United Kingdom to be taken no later than the 31st of May 2014, and that was on 133 justice police cooperation measures. 
Um, and uh, there was quite a convoluted process that was involved in that, but none the, nonetheless, there was a five-year window following the Lisbon Treaty, um, an ample opportunity for the UK government to engage with the devolved administrations and whether to exercise the blocked opt-out, because uh, arrangements post-Lisbon were that you, you could uh, come in on an individual basis, but in advance of uh, measures agreed in advance of the Lisbon Agreement, you had to exercise a blocked opt-out. Um, the important thing there was that, um, despite letters as far on as uh, April and August 2012 from Scottish ministers, there was very, very little action. Uh, and uh, it was very clear that the Scottish Government's position was that some elements that were in part of that uh, um, pre-2009 uh, agreement were defunct and had limited impact. However, and it's the big however, there were some very significant measures, and these have been continually alluded to. There were the investigation of cross-border crimes, bringing serious and organised criminals to justice, the European arrest warrant, where the experience in Scotland has been entirely positive. So what's at risk if we don't have that? Well, I'll, I'll miss out the names, but examples that were given to us about that time in the Justice Committee, which the presiding officer, and indeed my colleague Margaret Mitchell, who will be familiar with this, we heard instances of a murder um, and the individual was arrested within a day of the extradition request being issued, returned swiftly to Scotland. Importantly, the warrant allowed the seizure of clothing and other property before it could be destroyed, affecting the evidential value, um, and it actually led to successful uh, prosecution. Now, as, as I'm sure colleagues on the other side will say, yes, well, that did... Yes, indeed. Lee MacArthur. I'm very grateful to John Finney for taking an intervention. I would join uh, with him in support for the European arrest warrant. But he did say that um, it had been wholly successful. I, I think even as somebody who supports the European arrest warrant, I think there have been some legitimate concerns raised about the proportionality test for those extraditions. And I think that's an area where uh, further work will be uh, needed to be done without detracting from uh, the, the, the support, I think quite rightly, that's given to the warrant itself. John Finney. Thank you. Well, it's, it's an interesting point the member makes, but of course, if it's in the numbers gain, it has to be seen that it's five million versus the entire population of the remainder of the EU. So it does look disproportionate. Um, but the, the, the important thing there is that it was the speed and efficiency with which this was undertaken. Another example that was given to us of a, a similar measure was a violent attack and a murder in 2012 where the individual was arrested within five hours of the issue of the arrest warrant through the European arrest warrant system, but also, and importantly, by direct contact between the Scottish and Polish authorities under the European Judicial Network. So it's not simply the police operations, which are very important for all the reasons we've heard, but it's also the value of cooperation at judicial and prosecutorial um, level. And, you know, there was support from Scottish ministers, the police, the prosecutors, legal professional academics, House of Lords, European Union Select Committee Inquiry, that took, view, uh, uh, took views that the benefits of opting out of a defunct or ineffective pre-Lisbon measures did not justify the risk of losing those measures that are essential to uh, tackling cross-border crime. I think the most telling aspect of what we learned from that, uh, when you indeed, presiding officer, were the, the convener of the Justice Committee, was that the UK ministers did not consult with Scottish ministers uh, um, or the justice, Scottish justice agencies on that. And uh, although ultimately 35 of the measures were op opted back into, I would hate to think that that's a model that we're, we're about to see again. Um, because if we did, that would certainly be bad news for law enforcement, the judicial network, or civil law, or contractual laws we'd had. But it would be very good news for those who would seek to circumvent the laws, most commonly criminals. So the, the benefits of the European arrest warrant are, are, are well understood. The issue of taking evidence, I think, was issued by my colleague Claire Baker. Again, there's developments in that, both within this jurisdiction and elsewhere, and there are opportunities that could be lost. The Law Society briefing, and I'm grateful to them, talked about the stability in law. And they said, and I quote, the primary objective of judicial security and the police cooperation is the safety of the citizen. As a guiding principle, there should be no change to the law which would prejudice the safety and security of the individual. Well, we quite simply don't know. We're in a position at the moment there where there's lots of, of guessing taking place. Um, and again, back to Lisbon, the, the concern there was if this hadn't been concluded in time, that we needed reassurance in Scotland about the potential gap in legislation. Well, I think there's a, a big gap, uh, 
potentially opening up there. And it's certainly the position of the Scottish Green Party that will be supporting the Labour Party amendment because we think it's very important that there is this analysis. It's also very important that we consider the issue of transitional arrangements in any any piece of legislation you can agree, you, you know what's happened in the past, you can maybe agree what's going to happen in the future. It's the transition that's going to be where all the complexity is. So certainly the position of the Scottish Green Party is to support the Scottish Government's efforts in ensuring the following for the people living in Scotland. That's the democratic wishes to be respected. They have access to quality legal system, cooperating with others. Um, and that their security is assured, and that's best achieved by conflict resolutions. And we believe that all these have been put at risk by Tory recklessness. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. We call Joe Patterson, followed by Liam MacArthur. Mr. Patterson, please. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. I, I must say I'm a bit disappointed that Jenny Mara suggested that uh, when it comes to this Parliament, we shouldn't be discussing Brexit, and we should leave it to the Tories. Uh, uh, well, that, that's, that's what I took from it. Well, uh, members, if you want to take an in, intervention, I think it's better otherwise. What you're saying is not on the record. You're having a wee conversation to the air. Will the member take an intervention? Of course they will. Yeah, I'm sitting down for you. Jenny Mara. I thank the member for giving way. If he reads the official report, he will discover that that is not what I said. I said, you know, it's perfectly legitimate and important for the Scottish Parliament to be discussing Brexit. I said it's one of the most important political issues of our time. I said they need to balance this with issues that are affecting our communities every day up and down this country. Mr. Patterson. Thank you, well, I, I mean, I thanks for your, for your contribution. I thought your speech was otherwise very good, but it came across to me that we should be actually sitting down and let the big boys and girls say, get on with us. Um, Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, I, I think uh, I would like to start by setting out the scene and quoting a part of the Tory amendment. The members on my left are asking this Parliament to acknowledge the vote to leave the EU. Let's get one thing clear whilst this, this Scottish Parliament, we acknowledge the result of the people of Scotland. Presiding Officer, the people of Scotland voted to remain. So I won't be acknowledging any time soon a vote to leave the EU whilst in this chamber. Presiding officer, thanks to the mem... Yeah, of course again. Douglas Ross. I mean, I'm sure there'll be a lot of people worried that Mr Patterson doesn't recognise the result, but will he agree that it was a fair democratic decision across the United Kingdom that the question was, should the United Kingdom leave the European Union? And while Scotland voted to remain, there were constituencies in which I reside, Mr Stevenson, such as Murray, where the vote was very close, 122 votes difference between remain and leave. So the simple picture painted by Mr Patterson and his colleagues is not quite true for all of Scotland. Mr Patterson. No, I, I think the point that I'm making that here we were before the, the referendum and of course the Tories were out there telling us all to remain. And it seems to me that it seems to me you're very quick at, at doing the surrender speeches and hoisting the white flag in that regard. You've kept, you became complete converts to Brexit uh, in my view. Um, Presiding officer, thanks to the members on my left once more putting their party disunity before the best interests of the people. Scotland faces uncertain times, and that includes our distinct justice system and also the, wide, the wider way we engage with other EU members in regards to security. I find it interesting that the Tories want to protect the Union but equally ignore the Act in which the Union was formed. The United Kingdom is meant to be a union between Scotland and England, and it is right that regardless what one of the, those equal partners say, its, its views, its democratic will should be considered and not ignored. Despite all the promises made in 2014, independent, the independence referendums, and that a no vote was the only way for Scotland to remain part of the EU, Scotland now faces the very real prospect of being removed from the EU against our will. Like others, justice and parts of the security are devolved under the Scotland Act, and the implications of the Brexit process very much means that Scotland cannot be treated as a simple consultee or stakeholder. The powers that this Parliament has will be affected, and as I mentioned earlier, we are meant to be equal partners. It needs to be highlighted that this government and our justice agencies are working within the restricted security powers of this parliament. 
with our current powers and the new powers, there will always be that ceiling that this Parliament co cannot go beyond. The powers above that ceiling are, in my view, the ones that will ultimately unlock Scotland's potential in engaging with uh, the European international partners, allowing this government and indeed this parliament to make decisions to ensure all our for foreign justice and security policies are aligned to support the objective we, we have for Scotland, outward looking and prosperous. We have a unique and independent justice system, and if Scotland is not formally part of the negotiation process, in order to put forward our concerns to the wider EU, then our interests in these matters may not be fully protected. With the, invent, the, 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 the invent of the internet, the speed of globalization, and all forms of transport being on our doorstep, uh, it has never been more imperative that Scotland works as part of the, the wider EU community in order to fight crime and protect our citizens. As part of the EU, the UK is a member of U Europol, and therefore Scotland's police and justice agencies work cooperatively with other member states working on such vital operations like combating human trafficking, trafficking child sexual ex exploitation, and cybercrime. And when criminals are identified, Europol, on behalf of us, of us all, issue the European arrest warrants, which has brought about arrests by Police Scotland to 301 offenders, with 43 being returned to Scotland to face justice. It, it is my understanding that under new arrangements, the UK was until 2017 to accept a new regulation and failure, failure to do so would remove the UK and therefore Scotland's membership of Europol. I don't need to tell members how to... Sure, of course. Liam Kerr. Hey, um, would the member care to tell the Chamber with how many non-EU countries does Europol have cooperation arrangements? Gil Patterson. I'm sure, I'm sure you're going to tell me because I, I ain't going to kid you on and say it, I know what it is. Uh, I don't need to tell members how disastrous that would be for, for, for uh, information sharing and in some of the most serious crimes. If the Prime Minister wouldn't listen to this elected Scottish Parliament to end this uncertainty, maybe she will listen to the member of Edinburgh Central. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government has a duty to respond to the democratic wishes of the people of Scotland and will take all possible steps to protect Scotland's interests. If we find that our interests can't be protected in a UK context, independence must be one of those options that Scotland must have the right to consider. Presiding Officer, I commend the Cabinet Secretary's motion to the Parliament. Thank you. Thank you. I call Liam MacArthur, followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Mr MacArthur, please. Thanks very much, Deputy President Officer. Can I start by associating myself with the remarks of Douglas Ross in relation to PC Lawson and Fitzsimmons uh, and echo his comments in relation to wishing them a speedy uh, recovery. Uh, I went through my first, participated in my first uh, of these nine weekly debates on Brexit last week. Um, now I have the second opportunity in, in as many weeks. And as I suggested in the debate last week on the environment and climate change, um, I did so uh, willingly and enthusiastically, but against the backdrop, and I think Jenny Mara made this point uh, reasonably uh, in her remarks, against the backdrop of uh, no lack of issues in the wider justice and policing field uh, that are unrelated to Brexit and must be the focus of our attention as well. Not a week goes by without concern, further concerns being raised uh, around the situation that Police Scotland finds itself in uh, since the centralisation of that force. The courts and judicial system are clearly under real pressure, uh, and as the Justice Committee heard last week, not helped by the Scottish Government's decision uh, to close Sheriff Courts. And tomorrow we'll turn our attention in this chamber uh, to the Offensive Behaviour Football Act, a blunt, rushed piece of legislation that, in my view, uh, showed a government showing insufficient respect for this Parliament for civil liberties or the complexity of an issue where it had taken its eye off the ball. But that is not to diminish in any way uh, the challenges presented by the Brexit vote, as I did last week. I attribute uh, the lion's share of the blame to that, uh, to the Tory party for their failure to deal with uh, internal dissension within that party. I feel it's a decision that was both inward looking and a backward uh, step. 
And I thought Claire Baker made a very valid point in relation to the debate leading up to uh, the Brexit vote that was, I think, tarnished by the focus uh, on immigration. And I think, regrettably, uh, uh, for someone for whom I have the utmost respect, I think Margaret Mitchell was in danger at times of, of reprising some of the argumentation that we heard in that uh, debate. I think, uh, for the record, it should be recalled that uh, the 77 bombers were British citizens. The bombers in Paris and Nice were French and, Be and, and Belgian uh, citizens. And it reminded me of a quote uh, from Professor Malcolm, Malcolm Anderson, the Emeritus Professor of Politics at Edinburgh University. He says, uh, there's a significant difference between being secure and feeling secure. Although people may feel more secure if we take back control of our borders and have British border police checking all foreigners coming into the UK, their security may in reality uh, be better protected by the free movement of persons in an EU conjoined to closer cooperation be between police and security forces in partner countries. So turning to the to concerns that have been raised, I don't think anybody disputes, and I, I think it's implicit in the Tory amendment this afternoon, that one of the areas where closer co cooperation and collaboration has and, and should continue to work is in justice uh, and policing. I thought the excellent SPICE briefing uh, was striking in demonstrating the incremental nature in which cooperation is, has been built, I think, which is highly uh, appropriate in such a sensitive area where public assurance is needed, and probably reflecting the point John Finney made uh, about um, seeking collaboration and cooperation in an area where there are very distinct legal systems being brought together. Um, but looking ahead, obviously there is a lack of clarity about what precisely uh, Brexit will mean, uh, how, if at all, um, this can be salvaged through new agreements or falling back on other existing treaties. But to my mind, it does uh, seem to me op to open up uncertainty, delay and ob uh, obstacles that are wholly unnecessary in return uh, for little or no benefit. Turning to the specifics uh, in, in terms of, of policy and criminal justice and policing, I do think that collaboration has allowed mutual recognition, recognition of criminal judgments and judicial decisions, providing the underpinning for the European arrest warrant uh, referred to by others. And, and, and I think, uh, again, uh, referring back to the, the conversation earlier with um, John Finney, what I wasn't talking about was proportionality in terms of numbers, but more proportionality in terms of the threshold, uh, so that the thresholds triggering extradition, uh, possibly from the UK to other member states, to some have appeared um, lower than than they are the other way around. And I think that is something worthy of further um, discussion. John Finney. Thank you, Mr. Norton. I'm grateful for the member taking the intervention. Yeah, yes, I, I do understand and, and recognise that. But again, that just further evidences the need for dialogue and cooperation on an international basis. Liam <laughs> McArthur. I, I thank John Finney for that intervention, with which I, I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, that collaboration has allowed the exchange of information between law enforcement agencies and judicial bodies. And, um, I, I think what at best we're being promised is, is a restricted access to Europol and Eurojust, where the exchange of intelligence, the assessment of risk and the joint action to combat the threat of serious and organised cross-border crime, as well as ter terrorism, I do not think is best served uh, by the route uh, we are going down at the present time. Turning to civil justice, again, I think that collaboration and cooperation has allowed uh, a determination of which uh, courts, member state courts, have jurisdiction over a civil or commercial case. But in, in instances of cross-border family law, which are, I think are increasingly uh, characteristic, reflecting uh, the makeup of our societies in the 21st century, it allows for a determination of which court is responsible for divorce, custody and access, ensures recognition and enforcement of decisions in other countries, and I think, again, as Claire Baker intimated, uh, allows some sort of redress where partners take um, a child across border against the wishes of another partner. It also allows uh, rules around maintenance uh, to be agreed. And in terms of commercial law, again, it streamlines and speeds up the process around insolvency and small claims. And nothing of what has been promised to date uh, by the UK government seems to offer anything like as good a deal. UK citizens uh, hold out the prospect of no longer being protected by decisions of the European Court of Justice. Now, I recognise this has been a bit of a bet noir uh, for many in the right-wing press and politicians alike. But it is a bulwark and has been a bulwark uh, in safeguarding the rights of EU citizens against an overwieldy state in recent decades. 
In conclusion, I think the uh, SPICE briefing quite fairly recognises Scotland's separate legal system and all that entails. It means that specific Scottish issues will arise in relation to negotiations with the EU in the field of justice. This needs to be acknowledged. I think it needs to be respected and reflected in what now follows post the vote uh, in June. As I said earlier, there are no lack of issues in urgent need of addressing with regards to justice and policing in Scotland. Hopefully we will have an opportunity to turn to these in due course. Dealing with the mess created by the failure of the Tories to deal with divisions in their own party is something we could have well done uh, without. But in the context of where we find ourselves now, I'm happy to confirm that Scottish Liberal Democrats uh, support the terms of this motion and the amendment in the name of Claire Baker uh, before us this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I call Gordon Lindhurst, we followed by Stuart McMillan. Mr Lindhurst, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, today we find ourselves yet again debating the potential consequences for Scotland, supposedly due to imminent departure from the European Union. I have previously mentioned in the Chamber the stated objective of Police Scotland to continue protecting the Scottish public, irrespective of the politics being played out. And I do welcome preparatory action announced by Assistant Chief Constable Steve Johnson of Police Scotland ahead of the start of formal negotiations on these matters. There will no doubt be areas of discussion during these negotiations between the EU member states and the UK government. But justice and security is an area in which the UK, including Scotland, is particularly strong. Not only this, but the issues at stake are not negotiable. It is people's lives and well-being rather than tariffs and trade. It is, always has been, and will continue to be in the interests of all sides to adopt a reasonable and responsible approach in the months and years ahead. Security is one area where cooperation spans borders. Threats to Europeans have come into very sharp focus in the recent past. This was already mentioned by my colleague, uh, Margaret Mitchell. The UK's familiarity with counter-terrorism goes back decades now to the extent that we have security services that are the envy of the world. Of course, countries today do not always work on their own. Given modern day trends, where terrorists disregard geographical limits and operate in cyberspace. However, and as Richard Walton, former head of the Metropolitan Police Service Counterterrorism Command pointed out just after the EU referendum, our security does not depend on engaging with the institution of the EU. Rather, the EU institutions and their agencies are but one platform from which information sharing takes place, and the practice will still continue out with its structure. The EU member states depend upon the vital information that UK agencies pass on to keep other EU citizens safe. Uh, my colleague Margaret Mitchell already quoted from that particularly striking comment by Richard Dearlove, who ran MI6 from 1999 to 2004, and the quote continued. If a security source in Germany learns that a terrorist attack is being planned in London. The Bundesamt for Verfassungsschutz is certainly not going to withhold the intelligence from MI5 simply because the UK is not an EU member. And I would ask my parliamentary colleagues, do give our European allies some credit for reasonableness and intelligent thought on matters. They are not going to simply um, refuse to discuss matters on a reasonable basis. John Finney. Would the member accept that history is peppered with uh, lots of instances where the, the difficulties that have arisen have been because security services haven't shared information, notably the US? Mr Lindhurst. The member makes a very good point. That is something that has happened, of course, even within our own country, even within the United Kingdom, even within Scotland. And I think that is something that has carried on in spite of whatever efforts have been made to ensure proper information sharing. But I take his point, it is very important that security services do share information and that should and no doubt will continue. 
If I might carry on, let us bear this matter in mind when we consider other areas of crime and justice as well. As a result of the establishment of the principle of freedom of movement, member states have cooperated more fully in justice matters. For example, what has already been mentioned, the European arrest warrant. If we look at its use in Scotland, we see that in 2015, for example, there were 78 extraditions from Scotland under an EAW and the conclusion of court proceedings, but only nine took place into Scotland in the same year. Whether or not the UK remains party to the EAW post-Brexit may or may not be a matter for discussion, but it is clear that cooperation to expedite extraditions for criminals who have crossed borders is as much a priority for the EU member states, if not more so, than it is for Scotland. In areas that the UK has opted into, including in civil justice, negotiations will no doubt take place as to how matters develop, sorry, develop going forward. Scotland, with a different legal system, as has already been noted, than the rest of the UK, may be affected differently and will be involved, as it always has been, in adding its voice to the discussions. The Scottish Government has previously noted its backing for the mutual recognition of court judgments, but it has also been supportive of UK opt-outs on justice and home affairs measures, which it considered would not have correctly translated into Scots private law. Scaremongering as to the consequences of Brexit on the judicial system in Scotland is entirely premature. The European Union is not a nation state. It relies upon the already existing, pre-existing and continuing to exist national legal systems such as the system we have in Scotland. That will not change when we leave the EU. Leaving the EU will of itself not alter one of the many acts of parliament or regulations which have effectively transposed EU rules or regulations into our law. Deputy Presiding Officer, let me conclude by saying that there may be much work to be done in the negotiations on leaving the EU, but the UK and Scotland add a great deal of value in the area of justice and security. I'm certain that EU member states will both recognize this and the moral imperative of working together to keep our peoples safe, irrespective of the political setup through which we relate to each other. And of course, as a witness said, giving evidence to the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee today, we're in danger of becoming obsessed with Brexit. Meantime, the Nationalist government sits there gripped by Brexitis. However, I do retain hope for the SNP as hope indeed springs eternal. Thank you, Mr. Lindhurst. Stuart McMillan, to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Mr. McMillan, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Just at the outset, just I want to touch upon a couple of comments that have been made by uh, other members. Uh, certainly, Douglas Ross, in his uh, opening contribution and his opening comment, spoke about uh, being right and just then, seven minutes later. Uh, he was complaining about the number of EU debates in the Chamber. And uh, so, well, Liam MacArthur uh, touched upon the, the number of debates, and as did uh, Jenny Mara. But I'm quite sure that actually one debate a week is not overly excessive. I don't imagine anybody uh, could accuse the Scottish Government of being overly excessive with having one debate a week. And certainly in terms of any other debate uh, that takes place in the Chamber, it's entirely up to the members themselves as to what issues they actually want to raise. Now, if they want to touch, just, uh, just two seconds, I'll, 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 if they want to actually introduce a, an EU element into their contribution, that's a matter for entirely up to them. But certainly having one debate a week, I don't think it's, it can be considered to be overly excessive. I'll take Mr. McCarthy, he was in first. Douglas Ross. Oh, which one is it? Sorry. No, it was Lee MacArthur. It was Lee MacArthur first. Lee MacArthur, sorry. Thank you very much for the recount, Deputy President Officer. Um, I, I, I hear what Stuart McMillan's saying, and, and expressed like that, it, it perhaps does not sound unreasonable. But in an agenda that has three sitting days, where the number of debates in total has been relatively uh, limited, 
um, the proportion of Brexit debates that we've had, uh, I think, has been significant. And that does not diminish the importance of the issues we're discussing. Uh, but I think over the course of the last, whatever it is, eight weeks since we returned after the summer recess, um, the, the passage of time and the issues we've not had an opportunity to debate as a result, given the, the dominance the government has in, in determining the, the Parliament's agenda, I think it is perhaps getting to the point where... Uh, Can I just say that that getting to the point where it's more of a speech than an intervention, Mr MacArthur? I, no, no, don't get up I, again, please. I thought you said we had no, plenty of time, Deputy down, Presiding Officer. Was down. in the interest of helping. <laughs> Always, but still, it was more of a speech than an intervention. Mr McMillan. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I quite enjoyed Mr. MacArthur's speech, um, but no. But certainly, that's, uh, I think we'll have to agree to disagree on that particular point, Mr. MacArthur. But uh, I'm quite sure that the population of Scotland, if they felt as if that this Parliament wasn't considering the, the implications of, of Scotland and the UK leaving the EU, that whether it's on this particular issue of justice or whether it's on any other, any other issue, I'm quite sure that the population of Scotland would be rather uh, agree, rather angry. Uh, and uh, very disappointed, and no doubt uh, we as politicians, and also this Parliament, we'd be laughed out of court by many people across Scotland. So I think it is, it's imperative that this Parliament actually does have that opportunity to discuss the full implications and full range of implications of Scotland actually leaving the EU. And it's also, it is an opportunity for, for members to put matters and put issues on the record so that governments, the Scottish Government and also the UK Government, can actually consider these issues when it, particularly when it comes to the actual, uh, the actual negotiations that are going to take place for, uh, for us to actually leave the EU later on. But, presiding officer, there is certainly no doubt that Brexit will have differing impacts throughout the UK, which, as we know, is a multi-jurisdictional state. In Scotland, there will be a specific impact in justice, and the UK, as, an, as the EU member state, is the entity which signs up to both EU treaties and also individual EU justice measures. However, Scotland has always had a separate legal system within the UK, with its own civil and criminal law, as well as its own courts, legal profession, and the police forces and prosecution service. In addition, most police and criminal justice matters are devolved under the Scotland Act 1998, and as are most aspects of civil law. Since Scotland has a separate legal system, specific Scottish issues will arise in relation to negotiations with the EU in the field of justice. And safeguarding our independent justice system demands that Scotland is involved in all negotiations between the UK Government and the EU and to ensure that we're actually not just a consultee. It's, it is currently unclear what the consequences of Brexit are, are going to be, and much will depend on the outcome of these future negotiations. Consequently, by their nature, current reaction to the decision to leave the EU may involve elements of speculation and are also subject to change. Although there are differences of opinion, there are arguments that new arrangements have the potential to be more complicated, expensive and also time-consuming than the existing regime. There are also important questions as to what Scotland's role will be in the process, given that Scotland has its own legal system with its own civil and criminal law, as well as its own courts, legal profession, prosecution services and police force. Although the Scottish Government doesn't have international relations powers, which would rule out international treaties uh, with the EU, it's permitted to observe and implement international obligations, including under EU law. Now, uh, in an earlier contribution, Claire Baker, uh, Claire Baker uh, stated that crime knows no borders. And it's, it's a fact. I think it's a fact that every single member in this chamber needs to recognise. And it appears likely that Brexit uh, will have uh, a vast impact in relation to the remaining areas of EU police and criminal justice policy such as mutual recognition of judgments, exchange of information and participation in EU agencies. As regards the EU agencies, the UK can enter into agreements to cooperate with Europol and Eurojust, like other non-EU countries. However, as the director of Europol, Rob Wainwright, has recently made clear, such agreements don't allow the UK to have direct access to databases, to lead investigation teams or to take part in the management of those agencies. And we have to remember that both Europol and Eurojust have had British directors. Now, the importance of the exchange of information and intelligence uh, was recently stressed by Assistant Chief Constable Steve Johnson, who was responsible for organised crime and counter-terrorism within Police Scotland. And, and certainly we've also heard of various examples today by members uh, of how, uh, how that uh, cooperation across the EU has actually helped uh, Scotland and helped justice. Europol plays an important role in helping keep our citizens safe from organised crime and terrorism and helps make our communities safer places to live 
and work. And the European Arrest Warrant is an essential tool in the fight against crime and terrorism in the EU. More than 500 cases have been heard in Scottish courts as a result of the European Arrest Warrant since 2011. And it has also seen nearly 400 people extradited from Scotland to face courts in Europe. This is a perfect example of working together with our friends and allies in Europe helps keeps us safer and that this has been put at risk thanks to the irresponsible actions of the Tory government is really unacceptable. Those who use the Paris and Brussels attacks to claim that Brexit is safer uh, and not just, uh, it's not just only populist is in, in the worst way, they are just plain wrong. Internal security is not only linked to Schengen borders. The attacks in Paris in November 2015 and Brussels in March 2016 were carried out by European terrorists. They all had European passports. The main problem that Europe has to face right now is internal. To protect our own security, we should work on the prevention of radicalisation and the recruitment of European citizens by terrorist organisations. And closing the borders of the EU, sorry, of the UK even tighter would not change anything. In a globalised world where capital, humans and merchandise can go nearly anywhere, it's not feasible to fight alone. All security experts agree we need, to, we need to go towards a systematic exchange of information. Our secret services need to work hand in hand with each other. And Rob Wainwright, the director of Europol, confirmed that the UK would be more vulnerable to attacks and organised crimes if Brexit were to happen. Access to databases from Europol, the participation of Eurodac, uh, the passenger names record, all of these are tools used under European law. And countries that are not members of the EU can contribute with a system of opting in, but no one can answer that for certain. It remains a bloody issue, obscured by uncertainty about post-Brexit terms. The UK government must confirm that it will do everything it can to ensure that this vital cross-border cooperation on law and order continues. In conclusion, presiding officer, and the, the Scottish government has a duty to respond to the democratic wishes of the people of Scotland and will take all possible steps to protect Scotland's interests. But we also, we must keep all of our options open which means exploring, in the first instance, options that would allow different parts of the multinational UK to pursue different outcomes. Thank you very much. Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Liam Kerr. Thank you very much, President Officer. There are a few better examples of how the European Union has changed and developed in recent years than in the field of justice and security. The EU began life as a customs union, a free trade area. It grew into a single market. Its focus was at first an economic one. But as Joan McAlpin said, for, uh, separate, for a single market covering so many separate jurisdictions to work, the need for a common approach by law courts in those jurisdictions to an ever wider range of issues quickly became clear. And once that was acknowledged, it made sense to develop ever greater judicial cooperation, not only on issues affecting trade and investment, but increasingly across the field of civil law. And the very real threats faced by all European countries, mentioned by many members today since the turn of the millennium, have uh, made the case for cooperation on policing and criminal justice, I think an unarguable one in fighting international crime and terrorism in particular. Membership of Europol, as opposed to talking to them from outside, allows an even closer degree of partnership working among police forces in EU member states than working through Interpol alone. That is bad news for criminals and it is good news for law enforcement. Likewise, likewise with Eurojust, which coordinates the work of prosecuting authorities, as the Cabinet Secretary said, across boundaries, to a degree which simply does not happen with other countries out with the EU. And most obviously of all, the European Arrest Warrant, which transcends national boundaries in order to catch and return fugitives from justice to stand trial in the country from which they have fled far more quickly, as John, John Finney gave some very good examples, um, and as Claire Baker showed as well, far more quickly than extradition agreements with other countries around the world. All of these and other areas of cooperation, which were supported by every party of government in both Scotland and the UK before the Brexit referendum, all of those areas remain in the national interest today. It is deeply concerning that ministers in the current Tory government have not yet signed up to the new powers already agreed for Europol due to come into force in May next year. As long as we are in the European Union, we should surely take advantage of its benefits and cooperation uh, across the police forces of Europe is surely one of those. If nothing else, I hope the Scottish Tory party will support that sign up today uh, and use this opportunity to urge their colleagues elsewhere to take the necessary steps to maintain full membership of Europol for as long as we are members of the EU. 
I'm sorry Douglas Ross is not in the chamber at the moment because he was keen to tell us that a UK minister is about to make a statement on this issue shortly. Well, I hope either he or one of his colleagues will tell us today that they want that UK minister to stand up in the House of Commons and pledge to sign up to the new powers for Europol in order that we can enjoy those benefits uh, over the uh, immediate period ahead. Uh, and perhaps we will hear something of that later on this afternoon. Of course, although I'd far rather give way to the Conservative front bench, but I'm very happy to give way to Mr. Matheson. I've, Michael Matheson. I've noticed he's not present. Uh, one of the central points about making a decision on Europol is the time and resources which are necessary to take forward joint investigation teams. And the delay of the UK government in taking that forward means that uh, officers from Police Scotland who are seeking to engage with other EU states through Europol are already finding themselves in a position where other member states are saying, you may not be a member of this organisation come the end of next April, and therefore we're not prepared to start to engage in that discussion. At point. That's why we need a quick decision in this matter rather than further delay. I think, the, I think the point Mr Madsen makes is, is, a, is a very strong one, and I notice that Mr Ross has indeed returned to his seat, so perhaps we will now hear uh, that the Conservative front bench in this parliament believes that the UK government should sign up to the new powers of Europol that have already been negotiated. That is clearly an opportunity for him uh, to make that clear today, if he so wishes. The Scottish Government has, as we've just heard, already made that case, and that is welcome. But of course, we also need to hear from Scottish ministers how they propose to take these issues forward beyond the issue of Europol's new powers and what they are proposing to their UK counterparts as the basis for our future cooperation with EU member states. Scotland has continued, as a number of members have said, as a separate jurisdiction with their own system of law and justice through hundreds of years of economic and political union with their nearest neighbours. It is therefore essential that the Scottish Government engages fully in the formulation of the United Kingdom's approach to negotiations in the justice field, not least to ensure that what is ultimately agreed recognises Scotland's distinct position. Of course. Stuart McMillan. I thank Liz MacDonald for taking the intervention. Therefore, would Mr MacDonald agree with me that uh, having these debates is an opportunity, therefore, for the Scottish Government to actually listen to the issues and the concerns of all members so that when they are having these discussions with the UK Government, they can put these forward to the UK Government? It is, it is, it is vital. As Jenny Mara said, this is one of the most significant political events uh, in our lifetimes, it is vital that this Parliament fully considers that. But as Jenny Mara also said, it is equally important that the Parliament and the Government uh, maintain a very clear focus on areas of, for which they are directly responsible in our communities. And I hope we will have those debates uh, in this Parliament going forward uh, as well. Uh, but uh, what, has, what I think is important in formulating the Scottish Government's approach to negotiations with UK ministers is wide consultation. Uh, about the implications of Brexit, about what the justice system needs going forward and how best to achieve uh, what it needs given the political context set by the referendum. And we've heard from Mr Matheson something about that uh, consultation today, but I hope we'll hear more at the close of the debate, not only about the various stakeholders with, with whom ministers have consulted, but also about what the Scottish Government has concluded from those consultations and what it will propose to UK ministers to protect Scotland's relationships in Europe. There are, after all, plenty of thorny issues for ministers in both governments to address. Bespoke has become a much used term uh, for Tory ministers. But of course, UK participation in European justice arrangements is already bespoke. Uh, the Treaty of Lisbon allows the UK specifically to opt in or opt out of most of those arrangements, yeah. more or less at will. Uh, and, and, of course, as we know, UK governments of all parties have opted into some of the critical issues uh, we have heard uh, uh, about today. And, and it was concerning to hear from some of, the com some of the comments from the Tory benches in this parliament today, which appeared to make light of the vital forms of cooperation which have been supported by Tory ministers in the past. We can only hope that within the UK government, wiser councils will prevail because some of those things that all parties have signed up to in the past remain just as important today. But even if wiser councils do prevail in Theresa May's cabinet, the issue will, be, will become just how difficult and disruptive and time consuming it is going to be to keep the arrangements that we have already signed up to while leaving the European Union itself. It has been said, and it's true, that cooperation on policing or the courts is not confined to EU member states. 
Norway, Iceland and Switzerland are members of the Lugano Convention, for example, which supports the enforcement of judgments in the civil courts. And there are plans to extend a form of the European arrest warrant to Norway and Iceland. Other countries, such as the US, Canada and Australia, do have cooperation agreements with Europol or Eurojust or both. But as with access to the single market, which Norway, Iceland, uh, and uh, Norway and Iceland are members of and Liechtenstein, third party agreements do not allow external partners to decide the rules of engagement or to play a full part in the policy process. And if we were to join Margaret Mitchell's long list of external partners of Europol, for example, as Stuart Macmillan says, the police officers here would lose access to some of the powers they currently have. Uh, and in particular, British, Scottish and English and Welsh and Northern Irish forces would no longer be in a position to provide senior managers for Europol to influence the direction of the organisation yeah. itself. Yeah. All of this has very serious implications for the police and courts in Scotland and across the UK. We need to know from UK ministers whether and how they propose to retain the benefits of our existing European arrangements on justice and at what cost. We need to know from Scottish ministers what proposals they will make to UK ministers in this field and what scope there is for continuing Scottish engagement with European partners going forward. These are not abstract issues, presiding officer. They impact directly on people's lives. That is why we need a focus on what can be done now and in the longer term to protect the victims of crime and to protect the integrity of our justice system. Liam Kerr to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Security is one of the fundamentals of society, and we need not be internationalists to accept that this chamber should note the international cooperation necessary to combat cross-border crime and terrorism and promote Scotland's willingness to continue to collaborate with European partners. And the United Kingdom must seek a continuously strong relationship with those agencies which keep our people safe. But we must go further. Emblazoned upon the steps above Britannia Royal Naval College in Dartmouth are the words, it is upon the Navy under the good providence of God that the wealth, prosperity and peace of these islands do mainly depend. As true today as 211 years ago this week when the British fleet prevailed at Trafalgar, all but ending Napoleon's ambitions to invade these islands. Yes, sir. John Finney. Thank you, Mr. Officer. I'm very grateful for taking an intervention. Does that include having an aircraft carrier with no aircraft that can go on it? Liam Kerr. I'm grateful to the member for the intervention. I'm coming on to the defence of these islands very shortly. Napoleon's ambitions were ended, protected as Britain was by her best bulwarks, her impregnable floating wooden walls. Now, the walls long ago ceased to be wooden, but they do exist. They exist in our place as part of the United Kingdom at the top table of NATO, as a permanent member of the UN Security Council, allowing the UK's voice to be heard on a global stage alongside China, Russia and the USA. In our membership as the UK of the vital Five Eyes intelligence network with the USA, Canada, Australia and New Zealand as the UK maintaining a well-resourced GCHQ, which has foiled seven serious terror plots within the UK in just one year. And of course, the UK's Royal Navy, Army and Royal Air Force, which through the UK government's Strategic Defence and Security Review, we have pledged to support by spending a minimum of 2% of Britain's GDP on defence in every year of this parliament, with at least a 0.5% rise in defence spending every year. We commit more to a common European security than any other NATO member other than the United States. And of course, as we sit here today, just down the road in Barrow and Furness, they are cutting steel for the wooden walls of the 21st century. HMS Dreadnought and her sister boats, to be based at Faz Lane and built to carry the next generation Trident replacement weapon system. Not only securing the future security of this country, but also the economic security of the surrounding area, securing over 6,000 jobs at the Faslane base alone and many more in the surrounding area. And let us not forget the order for eight new Type 26 frigates for the Royal Navy, guaranteed by the UK government to be built on the Clyde, creating hundreds of jobs for the local population. So where the amendment calls for our security to be preserved, this is what we resolve, the maintenance of these great cornerstones as part of the United Kingdom. 
united. A divided Europe is bad, not just for this continent and or this island, but for the world. And that is why, despite Michael Matheson suggesting we are walking away post-Brexit, the United Kingdom will be Europe's closest ally and friend. It is why France and Great Britain signed the Lancaster House Treaty in 2010, as a result of which the two countries hold regular joint exercises and collaborate on next generation military technology. It is why since 2002, as part of the Combined Task Force 50 and Operation Enduring Freedom Horn of Africa, British ships have sailed with our NATO, European and other allies off East Africa, protecting the world's shipping from piracy. It is why we see a Europe sheltered and protected through NATO as our best defence against the key threats we face collectively in 2016. As the Prime Minister said, security cooperation existed long before the EU and it will exist long after. For many of our European cousins, especially those to whom the war or occupation is not a page in history book, but a lived experience, Seeing ancient enemies sitting around a table under a common flag must be a sight they prayed for and never thought to see. But look at what is happening in Europe. Only last month, the president of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, announced to the European Parliament that the time had come for a joint European military headquarters and battle group to be formed, a permanent EU facility for a joint European defense force, ceding UK command and control of our military to Brussels. Stuart Macmillan brought up the French attacks. The French and the Belgians are still arguing about intelligence sharing between them, with the French accusing the Belgians of allowing homegrown terror to grow unwatched and untapped in the communes of Brussels, whilst the Belgians accuse the French of refusing to share vital information that may have led to them intercepting the Paris and Brussels bombers before they struck. One French intelligence chief said, the Belgians just aren't up to it. Our security is dependent on Scotland's membership of the United Kingdom. If Scotland separates from the United Kingdom, would it commit to spending 2% of GDP on defense? Would it commit to joining NATO if that organization insisted on allowing nuclear submarines into its waters? If Scotland separates from the United Kingdom, it would not be part of the Five Eyes network. It would not hold a permanent seat on the UN Security Council, nor would it automatically benefit from the treaties and alliances signed by the UK with other sovereign nations regarding defense and security. It is clear that the security of our nation is dependent on our membership of the United Kingdom, allied to, working with, and supporting our European partners not dependent on membership of the European Union. And so our amendment today acknowledges the good in the government's motion, but we go further. We ask that this chamber acknowledge the greater value of being part of the United Kingdom to our security and calls on the Scottish government to positively engage in shaping the UK's negotiating strategy for leaving the European Union. Thank you. Uh, we move to the last of the closing speeches, and that's Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Let me just gently disagree with uh, Liam Kerr. Um, the, the, the person that really defeated uh, Napoleon was a guy called George Scoville. Uh, George Scoville was uh, Arthur Wellesley's uh, code breaker. He brought, brought Nicole, Napoleon's Le Grand Chiffre, and thus... Uh, from the Peninsular Wars in 1812. Um, the man who became Lord Wellington actually knew exactly what Napoleon's plans were. And perhaps in the modern world, uh, the use of access to and protection of data is going to be equally important. And there are important things on the European stage uh, that relate to that. GCHQ, uh, which actually was the home uh, of public key cryptography. Crooks and Cox were the original inventors, although now it's attributed to the 1977 
uh, MIT patent that went in the name of Rivest, Shamir and Edelman. The secrecy of GCH crew meant the UK was denied the commercial advantage and the intellectual opprobrium uh, of the world uh, for the invention of the software and the algorithms that continue uh, to protect uh, our data uh, to this very day. We, of course, will not be in a position if we cut ourselves off from the world in the way that appears to be the case, uh, to develop both the means to make and the means to break cryptography. Because when we're dealing with crime, we need to be able to break into the codes and encryptions that criminals use. But equally, we need to be able to produce robust protections for our data, because that is at the very basis of our national security, more than the old arguments about hardware. The future will much more be about fighting cyber wars and cyber crime. With people coming to our universities from across the world to share their intellect and their ideas, we are in a position to develop the kind of protections that we need. With the cutting of ties with European institutions and the setting up of barriers allowing the free movement of people, we will not have the intellectual and multinational capacity uh, to fight the world in the internet. And the internet is one of these things which de facto knows no boundaries whatsoever. It creates commercial and intellectual and cultural opportunity but it equally creates threats to which we need to respond as well. The internet is, of course, a place with fewer rules than we would probably put in place if we developed it from scratch today. Uh, it uh, enables people to spoof from whom emails come. It enables phishing uh, attacks by spoof websites. And with the moving of uh, Wi-Fi out to domestic at things such as fridges and lights, the Internet of Things, as that is now uh, called, it creates further vulnerabilities that require international collaboration. Only last week, there was an attack by a bot uh, which had infected many of these uh, domestic pieces of equipment via the Internet and domestic Wi-Fi and brought down the domain name server that allowed people to access Twitter. Now, there might be some of us who think having Twitter off the air for four or five hours was probably a very good thing indeed, but it is indicative of the threats that there are in the future from the kind of activities that can take place uh, on the internet. So don't let's pretend that the world of the future is one where barriers are going to be more controllable than they were in the past that will be more permeable than at any time in the recent history. And of course, terrorism is not a new thing. The founding of the special branch of the Metropolitan Police in 1883 was in response to the Irish Republican Brotherhood, a domestic terrorist organization in the United Kingdom, which included Ireland at that time. International terrorism, of course, existed too. Winston Churchill attended in January 1911 the Sydney Street Siege, where Latvian revolutionaries who had been conducting a series of bank raids had holed themselves up and special branch and the army were there to dig them out. Churchill claimed that there were lead bullets in his astrakhan coat as he peered from behind uh, the, the, the wall to see what was going on and got himself shot at. Whether that's true or not is perhaps a matter for some debate. In more recent times, uh, we had uh, the Balcombe Street siege in 1975, which again was Irish terrorism in London. We had the Bader-Meinhof gang in Germany, entirely domestic. We had the Red Gang in Italy, entirely domestic. So terrorism is something that both crosses boundaries, but equally uh, can grow in communities that are not socially adept at responding uh, to the changes uh, that there are. We've just been through uh, the fifth central government organized referendum 
The first being, of course, in 1975, although there was a referendum on the League of Nations in 1934, but it was organized by the churches, although everyone in uh, the UK did vote. This particular referendum, of course, is one that we're now discussing, the impacts on the justice system. But well, let's just go back and think what that referendum was about. The question on the ballot paper was a simple one. Should the United Kingdom remain, I paraphrase, remain a member of the EU or should it leave? That was it. It was not a referendum on immigration. It was not a referendum on the single market. It was not a referendum on the European Convention on Human Rights. In fact, it was not a referendum that made any reference in the terms of the question we were asked to justice matters, to economic matters, a wide range of matters. Therefore, we should not read into the result that it tells us we should leave the single market. It does not read into the result that we should unsign the European Convention of Human Rights, which, as Claire Baker rightly reminded us, uh, was very much the brainchild of Winston Churchill then uh, a distinguished Conservative member and former uh, Prime Minister. So not even can we look at the vote and decide what it means. Margaret Mitchell told us we should not reveal anything about our negotiating hands. Well, if we go into the chamber where the negotiations take place with a blank sheet of paper, I predict we'll come out with a blank sheet of paper, presiding officer. We now move to the closing speeches, and may I have Mary Fee, please, around seven minutes. Thank you, presiding officer. In closing for Scottish Labour today, I'd like to begin by welcoming the opportunity to debate the serious consequences of the referendum on EU membership and reiterate our support for the Scottish Government throughout the negotiations to protect our shared interests, and in particular, the national interests of security and justice. And the government motion clearly spells out the benefits that we have come to expect as being part of the European Union, from membership of Europol and the European Arrest Warrant, to consumer protection laws, and to family law regulations. And today we will support the government motion, and I am pleased the government have indicated support for our amendment which calls on the government to undertake a full analysis of the impact of leaving the EU on Scotland's independent justice system. And throughout the upcoming negotiations, we know that the Scottish government will be a serious and willing partner in protecting our interests. And the Prime Minister and her army of Brexiteers must respect that. And presiding officer, earlier we heard from Claire Baker and Jenny Mara and Lewis MacDonald, who all shared our deep concern for our membership of Europol and Eurojust. And as Jenny Mara also said, Scotland has a unique justice system and we must ensure that that is protected and there are no unintended consequences. Police Scotland needs our support to continue with cross-border investigations and to access the shared resources that fight cybercrime, drug smuggling and selling and terrorism and human trafficking. These crimes and their perpetrators have no recognition of or respect for borders or legal jurisdictions. And prior to the referendum in June, many security experts warned of the potential dangers of retreating from Europol, Eurojust and other cross-border agencies and agreements. And Rob Wainwright, the director of Europol, warned in the days leading up to the, the June 23rd vote that leaving the UK would result in Britain becoming a second <coughs> tier member, risking the shared resources used by police forces across the UK. And Mr Wainwright has also commented that the UK became the first non-Schengen nation to gain access to the Schengen information system last April after negotiating a special deal, with British police now using the database on a daily basis and it could take years to strike a new ag agreement, according to Mr Wainwright. Philip Amman from Europol has also commented that British police will find it more complex to achieve the same that they can now achieve after leaving the EU. 
And we know that the Cabinet Secretary for Justice has recently met with the Director, and we extend our support to encourage the Home Office to accept the new and expanded remit of Europol. And one of the problems with the EU result is uncertainty. And until the Brexiteers show us any sense of direction or any sense of a plan, the rest of the country will continue to rightly demand answers. And Scotland does have a unique pos position in the UK, given our different legal system. And that's why the SNP government must be clear in advance of any negotiations what its goals and objectives are and lay these out to Parliament. We need to know which aspects of EU justice law our own system make use of and what impact the Scottish Government expects to see if we lose these powers. And as a Parliament, we must unite and speak as one voice to ensure we do not put our security at risk. And as a former Home Secretary, Theresa May knows that Brexit will, will put key protections at risk, making it harder for Police Scotland and security services to do their jobs. We must ensure that the security of our country is not jeopardised by this Tory gamble. And on civil justice, I would ask that the Scottish Government inform the Chamber how it plans to secure protections on human rights, maintenance rights and cross-border family law. And the last Labour government made hugely significant strides in protecting our rights through the Human Rights Act. And we now have a, the hard right in, in the Tory government determined to strip these away and leave many people more vulnerable and at risk. Labour has also helped many single parents receive the support they need through the Child Support Agency. And with a more diverse society, many more families have parents of different nationalities. And in the unfortunate event of the disintegration of that family unit, it would be a tragedy for a family to lose out on maintenance support if one parent were forced to leave the UK. There are still many complex issues to arise from the EU result. And for the Scottish Government, lots of strenuous negotiations will take place with what appears to be a Tory government willing to risk many safeguards and the human rights of our citizens. And, presiding officer, when people were asked to vote in the EU referendum, many were misled by the arguments of the Leave campaign that sought to split communities and families on issues around immigration and EU contributions. And Scottish Labour is committed to maintaining our access to the single market and the criminal justice mechanisms which protect Scotland and the UK. And finally, presiding officer, no matter how the country voted, I believe nobody did so to put our security and our justice system at risk. And now the challenge is for the Scottish and the UK governments to work together to minimise any impact Brexit will have on the security of our people. And in closing, can I reiterate our support for the government motion and ask that you support Claire Baker's amendment. Thank you. Call Oliver Mundell, around nine minutes, please, Mr Mundell. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I close today's justice debate as an unapologetic Brexiteer, uh, a proud Scot and, yes, a committed unionist, because nothing that I have heard in this chamber today has shaken my underlying optimism uh, and my belief in the boundless uh, capacity, skill and potential our legal and criminal, criminal justice system has to cope with the challenges ahead and to overcome them. Maybe I've got more confidence than the Scottish Government, but I do not believe that we're too wee or too small to make a success of Brexit, both in terms of the justice portfolio and more widely. However, if we're going to achieve that, we need to stop dithering and start looking at putting the correct transitional measures in place and exploring the opportunities that do exist. And that's not just a task for the UK government, but it's also a task for the Scottish government, particularly in, within the justice portfolio, because as Mary Fee has, has just very eloquently said, you know, Scotland does have a separate legal system. And I, I think the SNP 
you know, are, are, are really trying to pull the wool over the people of Scotland's eyes because if we're leaving uh, considerations about what's best for the Scottish legal system, which has devolved in responsibility to this parliament, to Westminster to decide, mm -hmm. then I, I, I just think that's a little bit uh, pathetic. And what we actually need to see uh, from ministers, and I'm sure uh, that uh, Mike Russell will fill us all in uh, and show, exactly, show the UK government exactly how it's done when it comes to setting out detailed, uh, principled goals and objectives uh, on how we plan to take matters forward uh, for the Scottish uh, legal system and criminal justice here in our country. Yeah, I'll take an intervention. Stuart Stevenson. I note that uh, Margaret Mitchell said we should not reveal the negotiating hand for the UK to any degree whatsoever. Is he taking a different position in relation to Scotland's position? Oliver Mundell. Uh, yes, I, I am. I think the Scottish Government is in a different position uh, to the UK Government. The UK Government has to go into a room with 27 other member states and make the case on behalf of the whole United Kingdom. The role of the Scottish Government and where they can make a real difference for the people of Scotland is about getting... Is, is about is about setting out clear goals and objectives that they want the UK government to deliver on so that we as a people uh, beyond just this parliament can then measure whether or not the deal is that, that, that is done delivers for the people across Scotland. And I think we've already been, sh I'll make a little bit of progress first, uh, but I'm prepared to come back to him. Indeed, you know, I think we've already been shown the way. I've sat through this whole debate and heard countless uh, members uh, make reference to uh, the briefing paper prepared by the Law Society of Scotland. And I think it is a sad indictment on this Parliament that we're relying on professional bodies to provide the bulk of the information and to bring forward the detail and to identify the issues. And then we effectively hear the same speech over and over again where people trot out a list of grievances, a list of problems, but we hear no constructive solutions whatsoever uh, and I, maybe we'll be surprised uh, when, when, when we get to the closing remarks and we'll hear uh, some, some constructive uh, suggestions that we could take forward, but we haven't heard them yet. And this just follows on uh, from a miserable month, hearing, the, hearing the, I'll make a little bit more progress, um, hearing from those who think that everything's awful and that if only people would listen to them, then everything would suddenly and miraculously be fixed. Um, and I, I just think that whilst the Scottish Government have been running round like chicken licking, telling the people of our country that sky, the sky is going to fall in, the reality is that business people and professionals uh, and, and the hardworking people across our country have shown how it's done and got on with their day job. They've not blinked and they've not buckled. Uh, and more than ever before, I think that the SNP's contempt for Brexit it's not driven from a genuine concern that the European arrest warrant system or Europol are under threat, but it is, as Douglas Ross stated in his opening mar remarks, all about self-interest. If they're going to have a credible uh, voice and really stand up for the people of Scotland and speak out on these issues relating to what are legitimate concerns about the future of the justice system, then they need to acknowledge the complexities within the electorate and that some of those complexities might actually get in the way of their slow march towards independence. For a start, what the Brexit debate has done is break seemingly unbreakable alliances within the separatist movement, revealing that there are a great many people who passionately believe that Scotland should go it alone. But that means leaving behind not just the United Kingdom, but also the European Union, and I find it bizarre, uh, and I'm sure many members uh, will agree, that I feel compelled to stand up and speak out on behalf of SNP voters who, like me, voted to leave the EU, whose views are being completely discounted as the government pushes ahead with independence as its priority, rather than listening to some of the legitimate concerns people have uh, about the European Union. Yeah, I certainly will. Gillian Martin. How many SNP members have been in touch with you to ask, ask you to speak for them today? Oliver Mundell. Uh, that's a nice, simple answer too. Uh, my, my, I'd like to get back to my day job, but instead what I find is that I've got SNP supporters and uh, two SNP... 
to, well, it's quite unusual that they would want to come and speak to a Conservative MSP. Uh, I, I think most people would acknowledge that, that quite odd. But I, 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 find, I find that odd, and I certainly want to get on with my... I, I'm still answering the last one. <laughs> I certainly want to get on with my day job of pushing forward on the issues that matter to constituents in Dumfrieshire, rather than solely focusing our time on these issues. And I think that uh, Jenny Mara and Liam MacArthur, although they will probably want to disassociate themselves with many of my remarks, you know, I, 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 I do agree with them uh, on the points that they've uh, made uh, around focusing on some of the issues that matter, because quite frankly, the Scottish Government's uh, record on some of these issues relating to justice it, you know, is, is very, very poor. And we're hearing uh, of police stations being closed. There are eight of them in Dumfries and Galloway. You know, and I think it's about proportionality of the time. If we were hearing something new or something different, or we were hearing constructive suggestions about how to take the process forward, then it might be worth having this series of debates. But instead, we just seem to be on loop, making the same tired arguments that were hashed out during, uh, during the referendum process. Uh, yes. You. Stuart McMillan. Thank you very much. Fourth time, lucky. Um, but certainly, Mr. Medell, thank you for taking the intervention. But surely, uh, Mr. Medell can agree that uh, with, the, with the whole plethora of issues that are being raised because of the UK leaving the European Union, it is absolutely imperative that members of this Parliament have an opportunity to have their say, but also raise the issues and concerns, as you have done today, uh, from your two, uh, two people uh, from the SNP who apparently have contacted you. This is the, one of the platforms to actually do that. It's therefore, it's imperative that this Parliament, this Chamber, has that opportunity to raise these issues so the Scottish Government can uh, talk to the UK Government about these issues. Oliver Mundell. I, I, I agree, but uh, like his uh, colleague uh, before him, Mr Patterson, I think that it's about proportionality. It's about how much time do we want to spend talking round and round on the same issues without making any positive uh, suggestions or taking the debate substantially forward. Because this is essentially the same debate that we've been having on the EU. And you cut out the words environment and you insert the words uh, justice uh, here. It's not taking matters forward. And we have the same uh, minister uh, coming to this chamber to answer the questions uh, on, on each of the things, and as people have said before, it's getting a bit like Groundhog Day, but I will make some progress. Um, I think uh, Stuart, Stuart Stevenson raised uh, an interesting point uh, about, uh, about, the, sorry, uh, about ignoring uh, his, his own party, um, because I think that here in Scotland, people want the relationship to change. He said... Uh, that, that the result shows nothing, uh, that you can't read anything into the question that was on the ballot paper. It doesn't answer, it doesn't answer uh, lots of things, but it does show one thing. It shows that people in Scotland want our relationship with the EU to change. And instead of talking about uh, the benefits of uh, allowing Scottish courts... Yes, but 38%, if you want to intervene, I'd be happy. Have to, to close, please, Mr Mundell. I, I, over a, mil over a million voters uh, voted uh, to leave in Scotland. And I know, and I've said before, the SNP want to airbrush them out of history. Uh, but that, that, that's more, that's, that is more voters than put their cross next to your party leader you on the second vote. You must close now, moment. Mr Mundell. So, in, in, in short, uh, what I want uh, is, is rather than hearing that the EU is a utopia and that everything that the EU ever did was great and that it's got a divine right to exist, I want to hear from Scottish Government ministers... Mr Mundell, you must what, close. Yeah, I want to hear from Scottish Government ministers what their detailed plans Mr. are Mr Mundell, when I say I'm, you must close, I would ask I you to close. please close. Uh, I call Mike Russell for... Up to 11 minutes, please, Mr Russell. Presiding officer, and can I start by commending Oliver Mundell on his speech? And I do so genuinely, because I do think he has lifted this debate certainly beyond the uh, depths which it had sunk into on his own benches, because I do think that he has addressed the key issue. And I want to be quite genuine about this. Um, I am a passionate believer in the EU, and I will not resolve from that, just as I uh, acknowledge his position in saying before the vote 
that he wished to leave. Uh, that is an advance on some of his colleagues who now are rewriting history on their position on this matter. And I am a solid believer in the EU, and if he had been in this chamber to hear me argue for it before the election, he would have heard the same thing after the election. I, we've had half a century of peace in Europe. I think that is a remarkable achievement. It has prevented war. It has been economically beneficial for the whole of these islands. You only have to look at the position of the UK before accession and the position afterwards to see the remarkable effect that it had, and that cannot be denied. It has been an enormously positive force in terms of social protection and human rights, and it can continue to be so. And I could go through all those advantages and would be happy to do so in a debate. But I also want him to acknowledge, I also want him to acknowledge, and I'm dealing seriously with his points, um, and I think they need to be dealt with seriously, he has to acknowledge, and this will be a difference between us, the democratic imperative this government is responding to in terms of the Scottish electorate. Because the Scottish electorate voted 62 to 38 to stay. So we are responding, not just to the mandate that we uh, had in the election in, two, in May, uh, in a manifesto in which we specifically said that Scotland being removed from the EU against its will would be a matter to trigger or could potentially trigger an independence referendum. But we are also responding to the mandate in the referendum and we're responding to this chamber in preparing the options. And we will come to this chamber with that preferred option. The First Minister has already said so. We will bring that option, but it has to be informed by debate and discussion and research. And that's one of the purposes of these debates, in order to have that debate the member wants to intervene. Oliver Mundell. But, but we, we, would Mike Russell accept uh, that the SNP manifesto talked about a material change in circumstances, but was it not also implicit uh, when Nicola Sturgeon toured around the television studios and has commented several times on that issue, would you not expect that where there's a material change in circumstances, there also needs to be a material change in support, in the fundamental level of support uh, for the proposition of independence to have a mandate here in this parliament to take that forward? Yeah, yeah. Well, Michael, we, have not yet, we have not yet brought to this chamber uh, an independence referendum. And when we bring, and if we bring, if we bring that independence referendum, uh, when and if, when and if we bring to this chamber the independence referendum bill, then we will have to confront that issue of support. But the, 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 uh, the manifesto specifically referred to the issue of Scotland being, it is, presiding officer, rather difficult to actually have a serious debate if uh, one member sitting behind Mr. Mundell uh, keeps waving his hands in the air. It would be very useful if we actually could address the serious points that Mr. Mundell has raised to which I am responding. Because he has raised the level of this debate, and I, I pay tribute to him for that. Uh, so when and if that bill comes to the chamber, then we'll be able to discuss that. But it was in the manifesto. There is a commitment to honour the decision of the Scottish voters, and this chamber has asked us to address these issues. And that's why we are having these debates. And I do rather regret that the tone has still been from the Tories, why are we bothered from, uh, with these debates? Because the debates are vitally important. We would have been criticised had we come to this not come to this chamber and offered to this chamber the opportunity to consider the key devolved areas, to debate and discuss them, yeah. to put them in the context of Brexit, and to make sure that we understood, I understood, taking forward the task of, of representing Scotland in these negotiations, I understood the issues that member, with which members were concerned. Now, I am worried this afternoon, I have to say, because it does appear that the mainstream voice of, of, Tory, uh, of the Tories on uh, justice is not Mr. Mundell, who has spoken very well, but it is now Margaret Mitchell. And that should certainly worry every member of this chamber. Margaret Mitchell, who was the original Brexiteer uh, before the election, is now the Brexiteer who is speaking for the Tories on these matters. But I do think saner councils in terms of justice may prevail because we do have to recognise the real issues at stake. And they are, with the greatest respect to Margaret Mitchell, not the issues that she raised. The issues that Liam MacArthur raised, that Claire Baker raised, that the, the, the Cabinet Secretary raised, are the real issues of this debate. And I just want, briefly, Presiding Officer, uh, to go through what those are. Because Brexit puts at risk a range of cooperation across both civil and criminal law, including police cooperation, which assists in tackling organised crime, helps to keep our citizens safe, and also, and this is vitally important, to live and work across the EU. So when Liam MacArthur draws attention to the issues of terrorism, as he did very well, 
He then went on to draw attention to the issues of fam the family court issues, the commercial law issues, the issues of bread and butter in doing business in and living across countries in the EU. And those are the legal systems and the legal protections which people take advantage of day after day. And members of the Labour Party also drew attention to these. And unless we are in a position to ensure that these continue in the way they are continuing, then the disruption will come not, I believe, in matters of security or terrorism, the dis because those are very often matters of domestic activity and domestic protection. They will come when individuals are not able to get resolution in commercial, debate, uh, uh, commercial disputes, are not able to sign and enforce contracts, are not able to have resolution in matters of family law and divorce and very difficult personal matters. And there is no reason why those matters should be disrupted. And that's at the very core of this debate. Because what this debate is about is a series of choices. We hear from the, the born-again Brexiteers that in some sense this was inevitable and that this had to happen and these changes had to take place. That is absolutely not true. We now have to consider the balance of advantage. Where does the advantage lie? Is there a great advantage in not being part of or only being an associate part of these legal arrangements? Or is there greater advantage in being part of these arrangements? And the European arrest warrant is a very important case in point. Yes, there are countries who have, outside the EU have negotiated their own arrangements, Norway and Iceland, for example. But the time that they have taken to negotiate and set up those arrangements has been far, far longer. And the way in which those systems operate for those countries is much less satisfactory. We've heard again and again about case studies in this chamber in which action has been able to be taken almost instantly. And that's not just because of the procedures that exist. It is about the ability of individuals to cooperate. So when you have, for example, the Eurojust with the prosecutors sitting together in the same building as the International Court, they are able to build and develop relationships that allows justice to be well served. Not just the family justice and the commercial justice, but in that case, the criminal justice to be well served. And why would you disrupt those arrangements? For anything that happens, any weakening of those arrangements will disrupt them. I give way to Oliver Mundell. Oliver Mundell. I thank uh, the Minister for his uh, kind comments in relation to my remark. Uh, I'll be slightly less kind uh, in uh, reply. I think he's just doing the same as, as what I'd identified, which is identifying the issues. But still, we haven't heard a single constructive suggestion on how the Scottish Government are going to protect those rights. Minister. Yes, the constructive suggestion I, I am putting to, to Mr Mundell in the chamber is a constructive suggestion of first recognising the difficulties that exist, not sweeping them under the carpet, not saying, oh, they don't really matter to us, then saying, what structures could we put in place to avoid that? Now, we will bring to this chamber, as the First Minister has committed herself to bring to this chamber, our preferred alternative. But there's a better alternative, which is not to have gone down this route in the first place. That would have been the best alternative not to be in this position. I give way to Mr Mundell. Oh, but, but does Mike Russell not accept that that ship has now quite simply sailed? Mr Russell. That ship, that ship has 62% support in Scotland. That is the majority support in Scotland. That is the voice of our constituents in Scotland who are saying they didn't want this to happen. Uh, of course. I, I, think I think there's a big difference between saying that the majority of people in Scotland didn't want to leave the EU, which I accept, and saying that now 62% of people in Scotland want to disrupt uh, the Brexit process and are backing uh, this, this, this current plan to stir up tensions. Minister. Planning officer, I don't regard stirring up tensions as representing the issues and interests of the people of Scotland. If the Tory party understand representing the interests of Scotland as stirring up tensions, no wonder they're so bad at their day job, because that is their day job. Their day job is to protect the interests of their constituents and to protect the interests of Scotland, and that is what we will do. That's what this government will do, because never, ever on the watch of this government will we let down the people of Scotland and their vital interests. Their vital, their vital interests. Their vital interests. Their absolutely vital interests lie in making sure that whatever settlement is reached 
it is a settlement that ensures that their life is not disrupted. Not disrupted in terms of prosecution and certainly not disrupted in terms of the protections that come from the European arrest warrant, from family law, from commercial law. Presiding officer, we have an opportunity in this chamber of making sure that we develop a distinctive position. That's what these debates are about. So those members who criticise those debates are actually trying to walk away from their responsibilities. I'd encourage them to stick with their responsibilities, because it's only by these debates and by the discussion we're having will we formulate the robust position that Scotland <coughs> must have in order to get, not the best, because the best unfortunately appears to be eluding us at the moment, but to get as much as we possibly can for Scotland in the discussions ahead. Thank you. And that concludes our debate on the EU referendum. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 2258 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a revised business programme for tomorrow. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press their request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 2258. Formally moved. No member has asked to speak against the motion. I put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion 2258 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. The next item of business is consideration of a parliamentary bureau motion. I ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 2259 on the suspension of standing orders. We moved. Thank you. The question will be put at decision time, to which we now come, and there are four questions. I wish to remind members that if the amendment in the name of Douglas Ross is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Claire Baker falls. The first question is that amendment 2203.2 in the name of Douglas Ross which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Michael Matheson be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment 220.3 in the name of Douglas Ross is as follows. Yes, 29. No, 93. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that Amendment 2203.1 in the name of Claire Baker, which seeks to amend Motion 2203 in the name of Michael Matheson, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and Parliament may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment 2203.1 in the name of Claire Baker is yes, 94, no, 29. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is that Motion 2203 in the name of Michael Matheson as amended be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 2203 in the name of Michael Matheson as amended is yes 94, no 29. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. And our final question is that motion 2259 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on the suspension of standing orders be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. That concludes decision time. We'll now move to members' business. I would ask members to change seats for this.
debate.